So, topic for today, of course, is the overview of the Bible. Overview. And the goal is God strengthening. Uh, once we go through today's session, hopefully, each one of us would be conversant enough to say what books exist in the Bible. If you need to look for a specific kind of information, where would you go? Overall, what is the grander, the, the broader story? the top level view and stuff like that. So that's the goal for today. And so uh, once we go through this, when I say today, I mean this module. And of course we have an entire month for this module until we get to the second module, um, which, uh, which is in March. So uh, what I suggest that we do is, once we go through today's session, and as we follow up during the next few weeks, and then also partake in the Q&A, uh, session God strengthening on the fourth Saturday. If you can be of the mindset where you say, you know what, in this month I'd really like to get on top of some basic information about the entire Bible. Where if anyone challenges me on in anything, even if I don't have an immediate answer, I know when I go home, spending half an hour, how I can get the answers for that. Um, because believe me, the Bible is very, very solid. Any and every question that I've heard for the last 11, 12 years in Speaker's Corner, none of them are without a proper, solid, biblical answer, satisfactory to any inquisitive mind who cares about morality, who cares about justice, and whatever else, who cares about objective morality. If, you, if, if that's the mindset people bring in, any question that they have, we have proper, satisfactory answers. God's behavior is as we might expect, exemplary. As we might expect. I mean, the, God is not me, God is not any of us. I can mess up and I can be a huge uh, crook. But God, on the other hand, remarkable. Um, there is no shadow of anything dark or negative in him. Anything that he does throughout history, I'm not talking about just the New Testament, throughout history, anything that he has done in the past and anything that he is intending to do in the future have real, real superior moral component to it. And so, um, so conversant enough with the Bible is the goal for this month. Um, okay, having said that, I think there are a few other notices which I really wanted to share, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip on the remaining ones for later. Um, for now, um, if you can just um, assume that uh, we need to go through the overview of the Bible, if you can bear that in mind, that would be sufficient, I think. Um, I have, I have a few things printed out here, but uh, thankfully we're going to... Is, is that visible for everyone? No? So, um, I have a few pages alone printed out. The table of contents must be there, just so you know what we're dealing with. And apart from that, a couple of other important... Uh, I think four or five important pages are there. And they are the ones you really need to stay on top as we go through um, the session um, today. Um, in the live stream, uh, Brother JC, is that visible at all? Or? Have they lost the feed? No, sorry. Yeah, if I have the default in my family, are you able to, are you guys able to see the TV screen, right? Let's give it a one or something. Because um, I was going to be putting on the... Okay, cool. So on the, uh, Can I see it? Yeah, apparently. Yes, okay. So three pages of table of content there. If you can maybe pick that up first, please. Just let me pick this up a bit. Yeah. Yep. You can uh, lift the thing up. No. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Working? And can they see that also? Yeah, they totally can. Yeah? Yeah, cool. Cool, okay. Gobble. Is, is this all right now? Yes, yeah, that's what we call it. Yeah? Cool. So, table of contents, if you can just focus on the first page there. Our first session now, which is going to be for about an hour and a half, and hopefully, hopefully uh, you should be able to manage, because only after that we have our lunch break. So hopefully that's fine, because of our one hour delay, uh, this is what we have now. But our first session, we're going to cover an introduction, and also look at Bible and history. So, okay, let me, let me ask you a question, please. And uh, maybe people on the live chat can also answer the question. But uh, question, when you think about the Bible, how many different words can you think of which we use in our normal parlance to refer to the Bible? Sorry? Three. Three, Three yeah. Very good. So, um, Sister Sibyl has an answer there. Bible, we use the term Bible, of course. We use the term scriptures. And we use the term word. You know, sometimes we use the term word of God. So, I, I just wanted to, by, by way of brief introduction uh, to start off, I just wanted to clarify a few things. And that is the background to these terms. What does the term Bible mean? And some of us, I mean, some of these things are uh, relatively straightforward for people who have been Christians for a while. So please bear with us because some of the uh, people in the group are new Christians. Very, very new. So please do bear with us on that. The term Bible comes through a couple of different uh, uh, sort of jumps. Comes from a word which ultimately means book or books books, um, biblios, books. The idea is, of course, as you might appreciate, the Bible is a collection of books. Not just one book, even though to, we have compiled that together and carry that around it as if it's just one book. But they are a collection of books. And that's very important. For example, if, if, if someone asks, how many different witness statements do we have about Jesus? We can't just say, oh, only one. No, it's not one. We have multiple witness statements. Matthew gives his witness statement. Mark gives his own witness statement and so on. So we have multiple different and that's one thing we need to really understand. It's a collection of books. And when it comes to the word scriptures, where what does that term really mean? I mean of course to us it means the Bible uh, because of the application that we have. But in terms of uh, the word itself, the, the um, See the uh, meaning of the literal meaning of the word, what does that really mean? Any guess? Anyone? Scriptures. Okay. The scriptures. What does it literally mean? Uh, the, uh, it, it's actually there in the word itself. Writings. The writings. That's very good. So scriptures come from this, uh, the, the term scriptures or the usage of the term scriptures comes from the usage of the term, the writings. Now, of course, all Christians wrote all sorts of different things. But it, it is very interesting that, for example, people like Paul or Peter, and even the others in the general Jewish context, seems to have used the term writings as if it's a technical term, as if it's some sort of a special term, if you see what I mean. And that is where uh, we really get the idea, even though people wrote all sorts of things, it seems like there is a collection of books which are recognized to be some sort of official records or writings that relate to God's revelation. Are you with me on that? Um, even though the term writing could be generally used, because of the usage of the word in some sort of a special way, 
we understand that people realized not all writings were equal or equivalent. There seems to be a special status given to some books. Um, and that we understand because of the usage of this particular word called scriptures. In Greek it's graphe, writings. Again, it, in all the languages where it goes, it literally actually only means writings, which might seem simple. But in the context of how they were used, it's a um, slightly more uh, loaded term. Now the final thing, word of God. Now of course, uh, John, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. Um, is a, is a uh, verse that we are familiar with. Now when we say, when we use the term the word of God in reference to the Bible, are we saying it in the same way John, apostle, uh, the writer of the fourth gospel intended in uh, John chapter 1, verse 1? And the answer is no. And here is where, for I'll give you a simple example, which uh, not many Christians um, um, know um, in at least some portions of the world. You know, uh, the example is this. Jesus said, you search through scriptures thinking you have eternal life there. But they are the ones which testify of me. And we go on to suggest that Unless you come to me, your searching those books is not going to give you life. But we also appreciate John chapter 1 verse 1 is about the person of Jesus. He became, uh, the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's how John 1 1 uses the word. But if we, if we sort of rewind and go to the Old Testament. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Lamp and lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. Yeah. How did the writer there intend the word the word to be used? Did he mean Jesus, the eternal word? No. In his mind, he was talking about the written, recorded revelation of God. And that's what he meant when he said that. Um, so you see, already the term word actually has at least two different meanings in the Bible. They are supposed to be, uh, supposed to sort of converge if we are in alignment. For example, if you search through scriptures, understand them properly and follow them, of course they both converge because the scriptures testify of Jesus and Jesus is the eternal word. You see what I'm saying? So of course if we are in alignment with scriptures, they both converge, but it is also possible People can dwell years and years into the text, yet not know Jesus, which is the challenge he brought up in front of the Jews. So that's another clarification that I wanted to bring. Now, having said that, um, let's go back. So, what does the word, the, uh, what does the term, the word of God, really mean when we use it in reference to the Bible? Um, do we mean this collection of books only has words which were spoken by God himself personally. Is that what we mean? No, that's obviously not what we mean. We have people, there are all sorts of other, other people um, um, recording stuff here. A simple example could be lamentations. Who was lamenting? It wasn't God. It was Jeremiah lamenting. And uh, his lamentation, because he la lamented, is recorded here. And not uh, God's word. Now, not words spoken by God per se, but uh, something else. So, we don't mean, when we say word of God, we don't mean only words which God spoke. And that's very important because Muslims have a completely different idea. All sorts of other people have a completely different idea when they use similar terms. That's not what we mean. Okay, let me, let, let's take another example. Do we mean statements which are spoken by human beings, but are spoken on behalf of God. Are they the only terms we mean? For example, the prophet comes and says, Thus says the Lord. And he says something. When we say word of God, do we mean it's either words which God himself directly spoke or spoke through a prophet? Are they the only two things we mean when we say word of God? That is not the case also. And the reason is, I can, we can go through some examples in a brief moment. 
The reason is we find examples which might be completely abominable to God also recorded in scriptures. And the purpose was purely that God wanted a record of those things to be maintained for later generations to not repeat the same mistakes. So we don't mean both only words that God himself spoke and only words which God spoke through the prophets. There is more to the book. Um, for example, um, let me ask one more thing. Do we mean this includes either only words that God himself spoke or words that he indirectly spoke through the prophets? I'll add just one more and to see if that makes it comprehensive. The third one is words which God is happy with. Only words that God would speak. Even if a man speaks that, he says, I'm happy with that, so let's, let's have that in also. Is that what we mean? No, it's more than that also. Um, and we find examples of uh, so uh, similar things happening in scriptures there. So if you look at the, um, let me just uh, magnify this a bit more. So if you look at the titles there, so it's words from God's mouth alone, no. Only thus says the Lord statements, no. Only words which God is happy with, no. And then uh, what we find is, it certainly includes all these. It certainly includes all that we have mentioned so far, but it goes beyond that. Um, for instance, I can show you an example where, let, let, I don't know if you're familiar with the book of Job. Um, book of Job, in, book of, in the book of Job, Job essentially has a conversation with, apart from God, four other people. Three of whom ended up being in big trouble at the end of the book. God wanted to wipe them off unless they repent. Uh, God wanted to wipe them off. Um, and the reason is they ended up going to Job, giving advice which is completely contradictory what, to what was in God's mind. Completely contradictory. I don't want to go into the details now. But if you read the book of Job, just the last maybe uh, 10 verses or so, Go to the end of the book of Job, read the last 10 verses, you'd figure out God was essentially telling them and Job, unless they come and ask for forgiveness through Job and Job prays for them, the end is going to be really bad. That was the verdict God gave. But if you uh, sort of rewind and go back through the book, you'd figure out what they spoke, something like let's say 500 verses in the entire book correspond to what they spoke. Uh, 500 is just a number I pulled out of thin air. I don't know the exact figure. But uh, let's say one third or maybe one fourth of the book of Job actually were words that those three people spoke, which are very much recorded in scriptures. In other words, um, the Bible goes to uh, more than covering purely good words, also to cover bad words, wrong ideas. Uh, purely because they happened and they happened in a context where God wanted to cover those events. Um, okay, so now we understand what we mean when we, when we use the term scripture. So when we are handling this, we're talking about uh, things which are not just God's word, we're talking about more than that. Um, now how much importance or how serious must we be when we use these words if this is not recording only God's words that God himself personally spoke. How serious must we, be, must we take? And that is where we must really understand how did any of the word that has got in here really make it into it. And um, shall we say, simply, simply put, it's essentially, you know, you might be familiar with Paul's uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. Well, the number 316 is very interesting. John 316, 2 Timothy 316. And I realized only a month ago or so, I think it's one of Peter's episodes 316 also is a very important verse. Um, so the 2 Timothy 316, um, where Paul writes, all scriptures is God breathed. So even those ill advices that the friends of Job were giving are called God breathed. How come? 
Is it because the advisors themselves were God breathed? Or the fact that those advisors ought to be recorded, the decision to record them was God breathed? And the actual record is God breathed. You see what I mean? So there is a difference between who motivated them in saying what they said against who decided that those words would be recorded and how did they manage to record it. Those are two different things and it is the latter, the latter point which makes it God breathed. So when we say God breathed, we don't mean God somehow came and choked someone and said, oh, write, write what, what I tell you. No, that's not what God said. It doesn't also mean God somehow sort of led him to write what he wanted to be written in the way he wanted to be written. That is not also what it means. Um, in the sense that God did not overrule the cultural context of the person, the experience of the person, the mindset of the person and all those, you know, the personal things that the writers went through. None of those things God overruled. But what, what God managed to do is have a sovereign, let's say, authority over them. Even though they were, for example, in the case of Jeremiah, he was lamenting, he still acknowledged and received God as God and therefore God could still use him while he was lamenting to record what he was lamenting into a book for the glory of God. You see what I mean? And that is where the God's inspiration aspect comes in. Inspired in the sense that they were still sort of loosely motivated and led by the Lord. Loosely. Not tightly, but loosely. If, if God had tightly done that, then every writing would look similar and boring. Every, I mean, there wouldn't be any variety, there wouldn't be any, what's it term, beauty, there wouldn't be any human element. I'm, I'm mainly talking about human variety, by the way. The cultural, the variety that comes through, the differences in cultural context, uh, the change in time context and so on. Those things wouldn't um, show up if God were tightly um, uh, leading them. But he was loosely leading them. He was still in control. Because they were people who were led by God. Even in their weaknesses, they were still people who were led by uh, God. So that's where the uh, inspiration from God aspect uh, comes in. So with that in mind, the conclusion is even though this records words which God wouldn't even approve of in terms of being said, because they have been recorded by the inspiration of God, they still are important words. In other words, everything in the Bible, and I quite like putting it this way. I think, and I have explored the Bible for many, many years now, and I think the Bible, as far as I can see, is a minimal, comprehensive word of God. I mean, after going through many, many portions of the Bible, I can confidently say, even when there are repetitions, I can confidently say, some repetitions were needed and so on. I can confidently say, you really can't add more to this to make it a bit more explanatory. What is there is sufficient. But at the same time, I can also confidently say, actually if God had removed some of these things away, we might have lost a bit of oomph or you see the, the punch behind the word of God. Do you see what I mean? In other words, I don't think God was a bit sadistic to give us a huge book. I really don't think. I think God has thought through every kind of opposition that might come. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, uh, Mormons, Muslims, take anyone. You know, the kinds of challenges they bring in. And then you see, ah, this is why such a redundancy is very useful. You know, in some places, they have, you, 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 uh, few verses have been twisted to an extent. You might think, you know what, if only the other verses weren't present, they could have gone, we could have gone completely tangential to where we should have ended up in. You see what I mean? So minimal, but comprehensive. We don't need any more. We're quite happy with what we have. This is sufficient for um, our purposes. Okay, having said that, let's go back to the question. What must our attitude be? Um, 2 Timothy uh, 3.16. Does anyone have 
takes us to uh, uh, the Bible. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, if someone can please read. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Yes. So, we can use what is here, the examples that have been provided, we can use in our daily walk to challenge each other. It's profitable for doctrine. No one needs to introduce any new stuff for us to understand. It's all in here. So if someone says, I've understood a remarkable thing about doctrine, we can say, okay, show me from scriptures. If you can't, okay, well, let's pack that off. Um, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, we can really use this to correct both ourselves and our fellow brothers and sisters. If someone is in error, we can really say, you know what, what you're doing is wrong. I don't approve of it. Not because I don't like it, but because the word is against it. We can, sh we can uh, build our lives on this solid foundation. And that must be our attitude. And it goes on to say that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we'd like to be evangelists to reach out. Unless we have our base on this, we're not going to be doing God's will in the way God wants. Um, any other human ideas, human philosophies and whatever else can stay on top of this, I'm sure. But can't ever replace the Bible. The Bible is absolutely fundamental in Operation Stephen as we go through to train evangelists. Um, and I think uh, some of the people who have been with me a bit longer would know. Um, normally I'm quiet. Normally I'm a bit uh, gentle through God's grace. But when I find something which is contradictory to scriptures, you won't see anyone like me who gets really upset. And I'd say, I, I, I really can't deal with that. You re we, we really have a problem. You and me, I think we're going to have a big problem unless we have a proper sit through this. And that is my mindset. I get paranoid when it comes to any deviation from scriptures. And of course, people have different um, ideas about different things. And therefore, there is always a room to sit and talk, talk through what's there in scriptures. But my point is, we really need to take things seriously. And when we don't do it, we're not, um, the attitude that we have towards the word of God is not how God intended it to be. Okay, now with that introduction, let's go to Bible and history. Maybe this section is going to be the very, very important uh, section today. Bible and history. If you can get your head around some of the things that we are going to discuss now, that will sort out many, many things. For example, uh, Habakkuk spoke about the fact that even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, why did he say that? What was the historical context for what he said? Um, uh, Habak why did Je Jeremiah lament? What was he lamenting about? What's wrong with him? He's supposed to be a prophet of God. Was he not happy? Um, Elijah, he brought fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. Why did he do that? What was the historical context? You see what I mean? Um, many, many portions of scriptures would really suddenly make sense, clear sense to us once we understand the historical context. And what we are going to do today is only go through a brief overview, but hopefully that will already give us um, um, that will already help us reasonably in our walk with God and in our handling of scripture. So very, very important um, section of uh, today. Now, having said that, uh, in terms of um, understanding the um, uh, history, uh, history of uh, history that the Bible narrates, I'd really like us to go through the books of the Bible first. So if you have your Bibles, if you, if you take the index page of the Bible, and uh, yeah, for those who have got a copy of this uh, printout, uh, you, should, you should have the, yes, yes please. Can I use this, Jesse? Yeah. Uh, so if you, if you have that, that'll be uh, sufficient also, or the index page of the Bible, yeah. Um, and if you focus just on the Christian OT part, which is on the right hand side there. So, um, in regards to the New Testament, 
there is not much controversy in regards to the New Testament. Every color Christian across the world seems to be happy with saying there are only 27 books. In regards to the Old Testament though, there seems to be a bit of a controversy. You might have, um, you might have known this before, that um, different um, background Christians seem to think there are different books that need to be included and so on. There, my specific point would be this. Um, let's, let's do the detailed sort of argumentation later. The simple point would be something like this. Paul, uh, when he was writing to uh, the Romans, I think, he would make a remarkable a couple of points about the nation of Israel. And one of those points was that scriptures, and in his mind when he, were, when he was talking about the oracles of God and so on, at that particular point in time, he had the Old Testament in mind, the Hebrew scriptures in mind. And he says, they were commended to the Jews. So who are the caretakers of the Old Testament? Not Christians. It doesn't matter where I come from. I could have come from uh, uh, Rome. I could have come from India. I could have come from anywhere. New York. You take anywhere. Regardless of where we come from, we have no business as Christians. Unless you are a Jewish person by background, we have no business as Christians to dictate terms when it comes to the Old Testament. The Old Testament ought to be received as how it is commended to us by the Jews. And why is that the case? That is how God intended it to be. And that's what Paul said. Or the oracles. What is special about being Israel? And he goes on to say, well, everything. Because covenants, promises, pro prophecies, oracles, prophecies, and all of these came to them, the nation of Israel. They were the caretakers of the entire Hebrew scriptures and also even beyond. Even the cross of Christ did not come for me. I am a Tamil from India. And I can say that God's plan of salvation for the entire world was through the cross, which was uh, through the Messiah, which was a promise given to the Jews. Through them, I get to be saved also, which is interesting, which is very good. I am not going to complain as long as God saves all of us. Well, why should I complain if you see what I mean? Individually, I'm going to be saved. Why should I complain? But in terms of this world, the plan God had was, I'll work through the nation of Israel. And that is because of this one man called Abraham. God wanted to bless him. And because he wanted to bless him, he said, I'm going to choose one of your descendants as a nation to work out my plan. And so the point is, um, the simple way for now, at least when we are dealing with the overview, the simple way to solve the argument of what goes into the Old Testament is to say, what do the Jews consider to be scriptures? And that is the, that is the end of story. There is no more argument. Um, and that is where, if you look at the picture here, on the left hand side, you find the Jewish Old Testament. Uh, they don't use the term Old Testament, of course. They use the term just Bible or scriptures. To them, that's the, uh, when I say them, I mean those who haven't received Jesus as the Messiah yet. To them, Bible is only the Old Testament. Yeah? And if you look at the uh, table on the left hand side, you find at the top, it says 24 books. So the Jews have in their Bible 24 books, as you find at the top. And on the right hand side, you find the Christian Old Testament. Yeah? And at the top, it should say 39 books. Yeah, and this is the, 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 it should say 39 books. And the point is, but if you look at the lines, the, the sort of the rays going from the left to the right, do you see the, the rays going from the left to the right? You, what you would end up finding is, actually, in terms of the actual content, the 39 books that are what are called canonical books, are exactly what, uh, contain exactly what the Jewish Bible contains. That's the bottom line. What matters is the, is the content, not the chapter, chapter divisions, because chapter divisions weren't inspired by God. They were introduced by human beings just for easy referencing. But um, the point is, 39 books of the Bible, Old Testament, are exactly what 
the Jewish scriptures have. 24 books according to their count and that is because so if you look at Genesis for example, uh, at the top you find Genesis, yeah, um, Genesis and if you look at both the left and the right hand side you find Genesis mapping onto Genesis, yeah, our Genesis is the same as their Genesis, but if you move on to, uh, shall we say, um, um, Chronicles, which you should find, uh, or maybe Samuel, yeah, you see Samuel, uh, maybe five or six books down the line from the top. Yeah, you find one Samuel, two Samuel in the list in the Jewish side. But then, do you see the number eight next to it? Essentially, both one Samuel and two Samuel together is just Samuel for the Jews. They don't see it as one versus two. It's just one book. And that's why you see the number eight, only one number there. But in, of course, in the Christian Bible, that would be one Samuel and two Samuel. So that's things like these are the ones which lead to the differences in the number, 24 to 39. Similarly, uh, Kings, similar 9, you see 1 Kings, 2 Kings, both of them have the same number, 9. And if you look at the book of 12, what we would call minor prophets, you see Hosea, Joel, Amos, yeah? On the left hand side, do you see them? And do you see the number 13 next to it, next to those entries? The idea is they are just one book for the Jews. Combined together, just one book. But we have, of course, we of course see them as, um, I think, 12 different books. So the point is, the way we split things is different. But the underlying content itself is the same with the 39 books um, which are in the uh, canonical um, Bible. So what is called the Protestant Bible more generally. Um, so that is where you find the uh, books. So we, we so that's the books of the Bible. So if we just uh, maybe uh, now focus on the right hand side, Genesis, Exodus. I'm just going to quickly um, read through uh, the list there. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Yeah? The thing is that the reason I read that out is not because of course you can read, not because, of, not, not because I think you can't read, but because I really think we need to, uh, some of us might be familiar with all these books already, but I'm mainly talking to people who are new Christians, especially, um, where I think we really need to get conversant with using these names and trying to see what is where and that kind of thing. Um, and that's why I'm reading out because um, where I come from, and I still, still think this is true even here, which is, um, it's very unfortunate we have these things. <laughs> because the way, for, back, I think for years after I finished my schooling, I could precisely say, oh, this particular idea in mathematics I learned from this side of a book which I read. And I can say the side and I can also say, oh, that, that's how I'd underline that there and so on. That's how tactile learning helps when we use all our faculties. This is where, you know, children, they, they give them uh, numbers which are written down in blocks so they can feel, not just see the number, but feel the number also, evaluate the color code and so on. And the point is, I'd really like us to take a physical copy of the Bible, a, a book, uh, not, not, not the electronic, a hard copy of the Bible when we are really learning the Bible. And if, if, if you can, please make all sorts of marks that you want to make because all these, the way the way God has created our capacity, our faculties is really mar marvelous. Um, and the way you would remember, you might not remember hundred names, but you might remember the way, the place where you underlined something, and that might stay with you forever, going forward. And this is how, um, so this is why I really suggest reading. Even if you know you know something, read multiple times so you can become conversant. So the point is, uh, so we have uh, thirty-nine books there. Um, and now let's move on to, uh, sorry, one more thing I need to say. Uh, the 39 books in the Christian Bible, we don't, 
we don't sort of categorize them necessarily in the actual index. It's just one list of books. But if you look at a Jewish Bible, you see them categorized into uh, three separate categories. Yeah, uh, the Torah, Nebiim, Ketuvim. The Torah stands for the law. Nebiim are writings, and Ketuvim are sorry, Nebiim are prophets. Prophets and Ketuvim are writings. And there you get an idea of um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are all part of the law of God. That's where you'd find the rule book uh, and so on. And uh, prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and so on. Um, so that's how they have categorized. Uh, why, for example, we might ask questions like, why did they call the book of Kings? And then why do they consider that as part of prophets is a question we might ask because it's a very history-like book. And um, the, the, the answer could be something like, but they were perhaps preserved by prophets written down by under the jurisdiction of prophets and then communicated for example um, um, someone down the line from uh, of course samuel was samuel himself or uh, his own assistant sort of recording things and so on and similarly uh, kings might have been some other prophets like him sort of taking ownership of doing these things so that's perhaps why they were called prophets and um, later, uh, the third section, writings, um, are called writings purely because they are not prophecies per se, but records of uh, historical events or wisdom literature and, um, and the likes of them. Okay, so the point is, in the Jewish Bible, we have three categories. Now, New Testament. New Testament, how many books have we got? There is no, not much controversy there. Anyone? 27. Yeah, everyone on the same page. So, New Testament has 27 books. Um, now, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, and then Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and so on. All the epistles of Paul, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so on. And then um, and, uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and then uh, the epistles that he wrote to individuals, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, um, Titus, Philemon, and then uh, Epistles of Peter, and then John, and then finally the book of Revelation. So these are the 27 books. Um, now, um, in the Old Testament, we saw the, uh, the there are at least the three categories. In the New Testament also, we have um, a few categories in terms of writing style. Now, if we look at all these books together, there are a few different styles of writing, genre. Genre? Is that how you pronounce it? Genre of literature. Uh, anyone has any takes on genres you are familiar with? About both in the old and new. History. History. Very good. History. Po poems. Yeah. Musicals. Musicals. Psalms. Yeah. Prophecies. Prophecies. Action. Maybe. The wars. Wars. Yeah. Well, part of history perhaps. Yeah. Hymns, yeah, the the uh, poems, hymns, yeah. Basically, it's a style of writing. Yes, so the style of writing. Um, for example, if I, what's the the number of book, going by the number of books in the New Testament? What's the what's the what's what 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 is at the top in terms of style style of writing? No, in terms of number of books. Letters. Letters. There were letters. What are the, uh, what's the writing style of the Gospels? Biographies. Biographies. They are biographies. Um, of course they are historical literature, but in specific Gospels are biographies of Jesus. Yeah? Anything else you can think of? You can also say narrative. Narrative, yeah. History, narrative, yeah. Accounts. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, different kinds of accounts there. Any other style you can think of? Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, yeah, Revelation. Uh, I, don't mean the, uh, I don't mean the name of the book, but the actual content itself. Uh, it's uh, yeah, Apocalyptic, Revelation, yeah. Anything else? Prophetic. Prophetic, yeah. Eschatological, maybe? Eschatology, yeah. 
How about the first five books? Yeah, there is three, but there is something else to the first five books also, which we actually saw just now. Biographies, that is true also about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But apart from that, well, how do the Jews call it? No. They are legal documents. Uh, how, how much legal were they? You have an entire legal profession based on that. You see, the, uh, sorry, the teachers of the law, uh, the teachers of the law and uh, lawyers. You know, in the New Testament, you use the, you you have the term lawyers used. Um, they are um, the entire profession was based on the Torah. They were there to evaluate, and that's where the, the name judges come from. They were there to adjudicate. In other words, the first five books are proper legal documents. Um, anything else you can think of at all? Style of writing, well, not, not that I can think of anything else, but uh, but yeah, that, that, that we have covered much ground. Theology. theology, very good. Everywhere you find theology, whether it's poem, whether it's this, history, everywhere we find theology also. So we, of course, we, in other words, at least the point is we must appreciate a few different writing styles were used. As per the context of the time, um, thank you for that. Um, as per the context of the time and necessity, we find a few different um, writing styles involved. Uh, in terms of languages, which languages we used mainly in the Bible? Greek, Greek Hebrew, Hebrew, a bit of Aramaic. Those are the, which one? Which one is Greek? Which one is Hebrew? Yeah, all this Hebrew. And some Aramaic, yeah, only only a few chapters, uh, there's a speculation that they were primarily written. But firstly, the autographs were written in Aramaic because of the words used in the, and so on. Um, and then the New Testament is Kenegri. Uh, cool, so that's in terms of languages. And how do we perceive some of these? For example, there might be someone who shows up and says, oh, no, the New Testament, we, we think it's written in Hebrew, primarily, firstly or Ethiopic, or wherever. There are all sorts of different ideas, marginal ideas that people advance. How do we come to these, some of these conclusions? Based on documentation available to us. For example, in the case of the New Testament, it seems like it is the Greek documents which seem to have spread right from the center of Israel across. So the point is, well, why is this from the center all over the place? When what you were saying is only in a marginal area, not even at the center, but in a marginal area elsewhere. You see my point? So some, some such, such sort of reverse engineering or trying to uh, come up with uh, an evaluation based on where we get manuscripts from, which manuscripts are more in number and uh, where, which manuscript do we think the others were translated from and so on. So we perceive them by proper reading of words and understanding words and so on. So anyway, so that's for languages. Writers. Who are the writers of the Bible? Uh, the first of the books, for example. Moses, yeah. Any other take apart from Moses, perhaps? There is actually a bit of... Scribes. Scribes. Scribes? Yeah, uh, scribes in Joshua. But uh, the first of the books, uh, there, is, there is an alternative idea also, which is reasonable also. I thought Judah, Judah and Israel. Hmm? And the, 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 the phrases are repeated. Yeah. So a book I was reading said that when, the, when uh, Israel got taken up, th those Jews came down to Judah. Yeah. Yeah. They came down to Judah, and so both of them were put into the Bible. Yes. Oh yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm not not sure. So uh, when I used the term Jew earlier, I don't know if that's if that comment relates to that. I was using that in a slightly loose loose sense. When we use the term Jew today, we mean Israel. What is of Israel? So they are, but even though Israel are 12 different tribes and Judah is just one of them. But maybe I will get into these details uh, later on. But in terms of the number of books, uh, what I was uh, looking at was Job. Uh, by the content of the book of Job, it seems like Job might have been a contemporary plus or minus three generations to Abraham. Uh, uh, through the words, which uh, through the names of his neighbors, neighboring people groups, 
the way they are described it seems like they are all uh, family groups uh, and by the way things were organized even in job's family extended family it's it all seems seems like they were clans as opposed to kingdoms which began emerging later on so job seems to be there so in other words it's either moses or job uh, but uh, it's very hard what we certainly do know was that job the book of job was preserved by the nation of israel to posterity that we do know and therefore we we take it seriously as scriptures but what we don't know is who really wrote it first it could have been job it could have been moses it could have been samuel we don't know precisely and these things we are arguing about even now but what we do know is that they were certainly preserved right through right through the ages by the nation of israel um, so anyway so it begins by uh, from moses or job and it goes all the way to which one do we think is the last of the books written by apostle john and most likely the book of revelation um so so essentially john is about 100 ad uh, john's death is about 100 ad apostle john's death and moses lived around 1500 bc roughly so i'm talking giving rough dates now rough years just so we can have this clear in, uh, in our mind so if we from jesus' time if we sort of go back roughly i'm giving rough time let's say from jesus' time if we sort of go back 1000 bc about 1000 bc is king david 1000 years back about 1000 bc is king david and if we move back a bit 1000 about 1500 bc is moses book uh, move further back about 2000 bc or 2100 bc is abraham so abraham moses king david going 1000 plus 500 plus 500 approximately and uh, that's the sort of timeline we are talking about in terms of the time coverage uh, topics we discussed a bit earlier uh, um, theology uh, topics we uh, get to know we get to know about god we get to know about the devil we get to know about spiritual forces we get to know about how god wants us to live and so on there are all sorts of content uh, like that covered now having covered these things let's go to the history as per the bible um, the first thing of course is creation so that's that's obvious that's where everything began creation and then the next crucial event in the history of the world was the flood no white flood crucial because everyone was wiped out apart from just noah's family it's almost as if many times i'm tempted to say all of us came from adam but we can also say all of us came from noah because it's all it, it started again um, um and another important thing that happened during noah's time uh, because of the flood uh, which uh, peter brings out he uses a term the old world or former world archaic uh, world is how he describes the world before him uh, in other in, in other words i think with the noah's flood many things in the world changed how many we don't know perhaps the atmosphere was very very different and so on why do we say this consider the fact of how many years people lived before noah noah flood's time and then consider the fact that after the flood suddenly the age of the age expectation expectancy of life uh, s- suddenly dropped only for the next couple of generations it was still a bit higher than ours but now it's only about 80 90 years so abraham 175 um but uh, prior to that 700 600 900 that's how things were so clearly something was very very different in those days you know the, uh, the lord himself actually mentions when he before he sent the flood he said I can't put up with human beings for a long time. I really need to shorten their lives. And that's why he said uh, 80 years is the limit he set roughly. Okay. So that's so in other words before Noah flood it's the old world. And that's where the title of the first book I've written comes um, comes from the old world when we study things of before Noah's flood. And then in the new world everything began with Shem, Ham and Japheth. so all people groups in the world today especially the old people group for example i am a tamil and tamils have a very long history in terms of literature 
And so, um, I think if we study this a bit more, in, in a bit more detail, I might be able to figure out that, oh, I can trace my lineage here. In contrast, for example, the English, the, the English people group identity came in a bit later. So, but I'm talking about the old people groups. The old people groups, you can all, you, you should be able to, if you do enough research, should be able to connect them back to either Shem, Ham or Japheth. After Shem, Ham and Japheth, what do you think is the most significant event that happened after that? Tower of Babel. Why is that a significant event? Even though Shem, Ham and Japheth are three, of course, separate individuals, they were still moving around as one unit. All people groups, they were just moving around. But it is during the Tower of Babel incident where God split, uh, confused the languages, people groups split. You know, many times we, I mean, these days we study the f family groups of languages. Um, I am tempted, and uh, some people assume family groups emerged because one came from another and so on. I am tempted, tempted to say that might not necessarily be the case. Another possible explanation could be God confused languages, but he did allow for some similarities to exist. I'm talking about old languages alone. Of course, there are many new languages, later languages also. I'm talking about the older languages. For there to be some similarities to an extent, they were happy to be neighbors. They moved around because they understood each other a bit more than how they understood the others and so on. But of course, I think there could be a complex thing in play with plenty of research. Um, needs to be done in this regard, but at the least, Tower of Babel is the next crucial uh, step in history. Um, and then, the major thing that happened from there are the origin of nations. Where did the nations of the world emerge and at what point in time? After Tower of Babel, of course. Once there began, uh, uh, there being many people in the same family, family groups. And especially when some of them began wielding power over the rest. You began getting nations. Yeah? Now, so, so um, origin of nations. But if we cover all these things, which book do you think covers what we have discussed so far? Genesis. Just in one book, you get to know the entire context. If you are reading a prophecy somewhere, and if you find, oh, this thing would happen to this particular, um, this particular uh, people group, this is the judgment that's going to come. And if you don't know what people group that is, who they are and so on, you might have to go all the way back to Genesis to figure out where they split, how they split. You know, sometimes when you go through the Bible, you come across boring stuff or what might appear to be boring stuff. And they say, oh, Shem begat this person and begat this person and this person and so on. And I'm in the process of writing a book just purely based on the lineages in uh, the book of Genesis. And you find remarkable insight. And this is where uh, I earlier said, minimal comprehensive. It might appear boring unless you know how that information could be used. When you figure out, oh, this is how I could use this information, then you suddenly see... What might have been, what might have seemed as boring stuff would suddenly look like a treasure trove. Oh, oh this is where he comes from. That's, oh, that is why he responded in that particular way. And so on. You might begin seeing all those uh, things. And uh, let me throw in uh, just a quick example. The Palestinian conflict that's currently happening. Uh, of course, uh, Christians, many non-Christians think it's on recent it's all from 1948 or whatever. But Christians think it goes back a bit further. But very few know where it began. Um, and I think there are some remarkable prophecies about what's happening there now in scriptures, precisely explaining what's happening, how the nation of uh, the people of Palestine are not getting freedom purely because they're motivated by, they're encouraged by the rest of the Arabian neighbors to ask for a particular thing which they'll, which they'll never get. But they are motivated to ask only that. I want Israel to be wiped out. Is what they are asking for. Who is motivating them? Not them, but their neighbors. And you would find prophecies of this in Obadiah. 
how people will use this people group, exploit them, and they won't have their own say pure, and they'll also express, you know, who is the leader of Palestine today, Palestin Palestinians today? What kind of leaders do they have? <laughs> Hamas, Hezbollah. Hamas, Hezbollah. What kind of leaders are they? Terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't use the term terrorist, you still left, they are terrorists, yeah? Even if you don't use the term terrorist, they are still left to, uh, we are still left to using the term armed militants, or armed leaders. Now, wouldn't you like to have some people who have leadership in terms of wisdom, ideas? You see what I'm saying? Wouldn't you like to have such people as your leaders? Well, who are they? For Palestinians, they haven't got. Go to prophecies in Obadiah, you'd find that. You'd find precisely how God prophesied what kind of leaders would lead the nation um, of Edom at that time and so on. So you'd find uh, some of these things there. Uh, the, the point is origin of nations, behavior of ancient people groups, you can trace them all back to scriptures and uh, the way they split and so on. Um, Israel's history. Uh, so, uh, one of the nations which emerged is, of course, the nation of Israel. As you can imagine, of course, the nation of Israel comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, in the book of Genesis, you not alone find who Ham and uh, Japheth begot, but you also find who Shem begot. And then uh, from Shem, you also find the lineage coming to um, Terah and then Abraham, or Abraham at that time. And when Abraham was there, God said, okay, now I want you to leave your country, your, your, your family, your neighborhood, and I want you to go to a place where I show you. That's where an, a new nation began, but a new kind of nation also. And this is why through the rest of the Old Testament, the focus for God would be always through the nation of Israel. If anyone fights against Israel, God would see them as people fighting against him, unless there is a necessary reason to fight against them, like God himself sending them to, uh, to, um, to uh, discipline the nation of Israel and so on. So the point is, how did that change begin? Uh, how, 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 how did Israel be, uh, get that special status? And the reason Israel got that special status was because the origin of the nation of Israel was in the will of God. You know, in the book of John, we find um, not born of flesh, or not born through the will of man, but through the will of God. Those are the ones who are the born again as we might appreciate in the New Testament. But the point is, we can have children according to our will. That's a normal delivery process of children. But there are some occasions where God wills. God says, can you please do this? And then a child is born. And that's according to God's plan. Similarly, in terms of nations, the nation which began to exist on the face of the earth purely because God willed was the nation of Israel. And God said, Abraham, leave, go somewhere where you'd be a foreigner. No one to support you, but I'd support you. I would feed you. I would make you a great nation. Every other nation, they came into being by themselves. And so that's the nation of Israel. Um, we find the emergence of that nation also um, uh, amongst uh, the rest of the nations in the book of Genesis. Okay, um, now moving on from there, the rest of the books of the Old Testament, what do they cover? The rest of the books of the Old Testament cover the aspect of how God picked up the nation of Israel, gave them a law so they understand what kind of God he is, and what he expects the nation of Israel, how he expects the nation of Israel to be. And then when they go against that, deviate from that, God comes in and corrects them. When they go far, far away, he comes in, corrects them very severely, even by sending other nations to fight against them, to limit them, and so on. But ultimately the point was from Genesis, from Exodus, from the book of Exodus. The entire story going up to Malachi, the book of Malachi, is how God leads the nation of Israel in all the troubles that they go through, but beginning at the point where he gives them a law. So there's an introduction there. The law indicates the nature of God. I like this. I don't want you to murder. 
And that law, that legal point means I don't like murdering. I don't want you to look at another man's wife. And that specific legal point means I don't like that. So what God did not like showed up as legal points. Don't do it. What God liked showed up as legal points to say do it. In other words, the nation was supposed to know who God is through the law at that particular point in time. And this is why uh, the psalmist says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. And this is why King David himself said, I meditate on your word. Why does anyone have to meditate on a legal document? How many lawyers meditate on a legal document? Uh, they might meditate to figure out how to, where the loophole is just to try and see if they can help a client. Yeah, but why should David? David wasn't intending to find out loopholes. Why should he have to meditate? And the reason to meditate is because what is uh, what the ultimate the, the ultimate learning point for him is not the legal point, although that is important for him to put in practice. The ultimate point for him is to understand the God behind the law, the God who then prophesies you messed up or you've done well and therefore so he wanted to understand where God was coming from what was his mindset what does he like what does he not like he really wanted to grapple with the person of Yahweh the God himself and that's why he says I meditate on your word um, so yeah so, so he, he gave a law and then the rest of this journey is when Israel grappled with the law, they were essentially saying, we are willing to understand you, God, and we are willing to obey you. And when they obeyed, God commended them, uh, made them flourish. And when they disobeyed, God said, mm, you're not supposed to do this. I'm going to send you a prophet to say, you are wrong, change. And then to send again. But if you persist in your misunderstanding, I'll send Assyria to you. I'll send Babylon to you. I'll send Greece to you, I'll send whoever else to you to correct you. And that's what God did. Um, and this is why in the New Testament we find the verse saying, uh, the father who loves the son chastens him. So God chastened the nation of Israel. So we find that history there. Um, so in the history of Israel, uh, quick points, the crucial points, um, of course it all began from a group of slaves. A large group, maybe a million plus slaves that's where the nation began as a modern nation uh, when i say modern as a proper kingdom like nation not just a family group and then they were of course led away from egypt exodus led by moses and joshua and then later on by the judges once they entered into the land of canaan they were led by the judges you know samson deborah and so on all those uh, Gideon, all the names of the judges come in there and then they said they started began veering away from God they said we need a king 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 that's the way we go and that's where they began getting Saul and then King David and from there um, King Solomon and King Solomon was the last to rule the kingdom United Kingdom of Israel and then the nation of Israel split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah uh, roughly the northern Israel are 10 tribes, roughly the uh, southern Judah roughly 2 tribes but the southern Judah are supposed to have all 12 also because Jerusalem was there, Levites were there and during some particular points in time the rest of the people actually moved in to the nation of Judah purely because the northern nation were becoming um, disobedient. So they said no we want to obey so we want to move and then get in. So it's all a mixed people group but mainly Judah mainly Judah and of course Levites also. So, uh, so the kingdom divided, after the kingdom divided, the re, uh, after the kingdom divided, uh, the kingdom divided by the way because Solomon disobeyed, because Solomon disobeyed, God said I'm going to tear the kingdom that you have into two. Except he didn't want to do that during the time of Solomon because that would be sort of a negative feedback to King David. Because normally people like their children to be alright. Their grandchildren, they might be a bit further away from them. You see what I mean? So, to uphold the fact that God liked King David, he said, during King Solomon's time, I won't bring in a judgment. Purely because of King David. But because King Solomon did something terrible, he said, okay, your child, 
or in your next generation i do this which would still be considered as doing something to king solomon because it's his son um, so the nation was split northern southern and um, and then during the rest of the uh, northern um, uh, israel's history they never had a good king at all everyone were evil and more evil and more evil in the southern judah alone you had intermittently a few good kings but the rest of them were all bad a few good ones after king david but none to be like king david the one who comes even close is king josiah uh, where god himself explicitly testifies after king david i haven't found anyone like you um, so that's the sort of history uh, the kingdom of israel was cut short were cut off uh, at, uh, um, in the year 721 bc when assyria captured northern israel we'll get into more of these more details corresponding to these in the next session because we're going to find out why do we trust the bible that's our next session and there we'll get into these historical points for now i'm let, let, take this as a storyline uh, kingdom was divided at a slightly later stage um northern israel was captured by assyria and uh, um southern judah was uh, so southern judah still remained for a bit uh, bit, bit more um 586 bc 606 bc 586 bc were two attacks from babylon nebuchadnezzar is a name you might recognize uh, he attacked first in 586 uh, 606 bc um and then uh, and then left them alone for a bit and then they were still not they were still a bit rebelling so they came back 586 bc that's it uh, judah was over um until until uh, they returned back before uh, returned back during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, when uh, king Cyrus sent them again so this is the rough sort of history of Israel yeah can i please repeat this um exodus slaves go into canaan become a kingdom um the kingdom initially not not a kingdom a big 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 became a nation with a land but ruled by judges ruled by ruled by god himself through the judges at that time uh, one of the crucial judges the final one um in this regard is samuel um who is also a prophet of course um so from samuel during samuel's time they said we need a king and that's when you began having a kingdom with king saul there were only three kings who ruled the united nation of israel saul was the only uh, two dynasties one is saul and with him that dynasty is gone and the second is uh, king david king david's dynasty is the one which still uh, is supposed to be there even in, in the eternal kingdom through jesus um, so two dynasties king saul and gone and apart from saul it's only king david and his son samuel who ruled the kingdom Uh, who ruled the entire united kingdom and then the kingdom split and after that you have uh, the northern israel southern judah northern israel uh, 720 uh, 721 bc captured by assyria southern judah uh, captured later on uh, 586 bc finally by babylon um and then you might have heard the term babylonian exile you know by the rivers of babylon where does that where does that song come from well they were all in exile in babylon and so they were thinking oh how wonderful it would have been if we were there but we are here and we sing a song um so that's uh, that's the that's where the song comes from um um so that's where they lived but there initially it was babylon ruling them but do you remember the finger of god the writing on the wall that was the last of babylonian rulers writing on the wall on the very evening the last of the babylonian rulers was captured by uh, medo persians um, so uh, the kingdom the empire moved from babylon babylonian control to medo persians and this is where you might have heard names uh, esther who was esther married to ahasuerus who was a persian ruler medo persian ruler where does he come from exactly in this particular time period do you see what i mean in the book of daniel uh, you find the babylonians and the uh, medo persians taking over uh, so you find both of them 
in the book of Daniel. And then Esther, you find, uh, in the book of Esther, you find the uh, Middle Persians. Um, um, continuing. And, uh, and then during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were released back. Um, Emperor Cyrus. Cyrus was the one who released them back to go back to their home country. And they came back to uh, rebuild Jerusalem. The temple first and then the city. Um, so uh, if you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, you might hear phrases like, let's build the wall. I don't know if you're familiar with this idea, maybe not. Um, but if you read, it's essentially, if you read books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you would think, well, that looks like a, an engineering construction book, construction sort of program management. What does that have anything to do with the Bible, you might ask? Because there will be plenty of conversation about how we build this, how we do this. Oh, we haven't done this for a long time. We need to build these things. All the city is in ruins. Why, why are we not doing these and so on? Uh, that was all in the spiritual environment where God was expecting them to rebuild and settle. And they were refusing. Because they were quite happy with their own families. They don't want to contribute and all those things. Um, yeah, so, so far with me. So that's an essay. Uh, the, the important dates are 1010 uh, uh, BC is a very crucial date. That's when we understand, even secularly speaking, the temple, the uh, building of Solomon's temple. That's a very crucial date. Crucial enough that this is used as a reference point even to, um, uh, even to um, sort of calibrate Egyptian chronology. Because Egyptians are very, very good in building pyramids. In writing all sorts of fantasy ideas on the wall and stuff. But they don't give years. You can't date them purely. You can, you can say this guy came after that guy reasonably. Uh, they might miss a few uh, steps here and there. But to date precisely, you can't find enough help there. You need to come to Solomon's temple. So it's a very important date, uh, 1000, around 1010 BC for Solomon's temple. Um, and then 721 BC, Assyria capturing northern Israel. And then 606 BC, first attack from Babylon, 586 BC, the final attack, and then Medo-Persia. So far, are you with me in terms of the history? Roughly. And then, of course, you can commit these things to memory uh, over the coming couple of weeks or so. Um, now, finally, where did this all leave them at the end of the Old Testament? During the time of John the Baptist, uh, Muslims like to use, uh, use this particular idea and... Uh, People came to him. Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not. Uh, are you the Messiah? No, I'm not. Um, are you Elijah? No, I'm not. Are you the prophet? No, I'm not. Why do they ask those three specific questions? Be any guess? No? Anyone? Any guess? Yeah? Yes, but why were they asking those questions? Why did they not ask, uh, uh, for example, uh, are you going to build a temple? Or are you... So something else. I mean, uh, of course the temple was there. Uh, apologize. Uh, but some other question. Are you... Are you uh, can you give us some advice? Could have been a good question. Why were they very keen on these three specific questions? To, to, um, to catch him out on the, on the law and, and stone him to death as a false... Uh, no, the ones who are uh, John the Baptist, I'm talking John the Baptist, but uh, even though John the Baptist did have enemies among the um, authorities, uh, people generally liked him. I mean, uh, even though they didn't like what he was saying in terms of what they had to do in their lives, they still didn't do, they, they still didn't come to the conclusion that they would kill, kill him as much as they did with Jesus. Uh, in other words, the point was they were very receptive to a degree. They didn't like to change. But they were receptive of the fact of what he was saying to an extent. Uh, there wasn't much animosity necessarily as much as it, it was with Jesus. But the crucial point is why did they ask these three questions after the time of Malachi? And this is where polemics, when we get into polemics, uh, when we try and engage with the Jews, these things would come very, very handy, very important. Jews today think, oh, Messiah still hasn't come and so on. That's just because they don't know their Bible. When they do know their Bible, after the time of Malachi, Zechariah and Malachi, 
Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, after those prophets, Jews were imminently expecting the Messiah to come. Imminently. Anytime. Just like how we are imminently expecting the Messiah again, Jesus again. We just don't know how when. But we, anytime. Yeah? Uh, I don't think it's anytime. There are still a few prophecies which still need to be fulfilled. So I, I don't think it's tonight or tomorrow or whatever. But uh, the point is, uh, but we are looking forward uh, imminently, sometime soon. Similarly, for a Jew of the first century, uh, for a Jew since the time of Malachi, they were imminently expecting. And not many were speaking out. There was no one publicly proclaiming anything for about for a few hundred years. And that's when, when John the Baptist, uh, even though he looked like a fool, with all sorts of foolish clothing on him, and acted like a fool, eating locusts and so on, even though he was a ma he was a maverick fool in the in the in the sense of a normal human life, when he began preaching, they realized, oh, we didn't hear the word of God for a long time. Now someone is proclaiming, could he be the one we were waiting for? And because they were imminently waiting, awaiting an imminent coming of the Messiah. Yeah, with me so far. What kind of people were they waiting? They were of course waiting for the Messiah and that's why they asked him, are you the Christ? But they knew Elijah had to come before that. And so they asked, are you the Elijah? But they also knew there was another person called the great prophet who Moses prophesied about, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, who was supposed to come. They didn't know Messiah was the same as that, but they were expecting. That's why they asked the third question, are you the prophet? They didn't ask, are you a prophet? Are you the prophet that we were looking for? Um, so that's where the Old Testament left them with, with an eager expectation. Now, beyond that, if we fast forward, um, just four points there in regards to the New Testament history. Um, what, is, what does New Testament cover in terms of history? Jesus, the apostles, the church, and that's it. And then it uh, leaves the door open because uh, so some of you might be aware, Book of Acts essentially doesn't finish in a nice way. It, it's almost as if God intended the rest of history, the, church, the works of the church during the rest of history also to be part of the Book of Acts, if you see what I mean. So, and then the expectation of things to come in the future, the Book of Revelation. So that's the history that the New Testament covers. Yeah, with me so far? Yeah, reasonably clear? Cool. Let's just now map quickly which book fits in where. And I think in the printouts you should have these. If you look at the left hand side column there, creation, man up to Noahic flood, Noahic flood, Shemham, Japheth, Babel, um, uh, origin of nations, and then in Israel, slaves becoming freedmen, Israel under Moses, Joshua, Judges, Saul, David, Solomon. And then the divided nations, and then further down, Assyria capturing northern Israel, and then further down, southern Judah being captured by Babylon, Medo Persia, Judah, uh, return of Judah. Are you able to follow the left column there, which is what we've covered? Now, in terms of the books, how do the books organize themselves? Uh, so, in terms of history, which books cover history in the Bible? You'd find actually, uh, you know, all the prophets, major prophets, minor prophets. Even though some of them do have a bit of history, I'm talking about the Christian Bible terminologies that we use here, yeah, major prophets, minor prophets. Um, apart from the major prophets, minor prophets and wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, if you keep them aside, it is only the rest of the books which cover history, primarily. And so essentially you would be able to cover all that we have spoken about so far in the second column. As you can imagine, until the origin of nations, it's Genesis primarily. Primarily Genesis. Um, and then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Israel under Moses. Yeah? Israel under Joshua, Joshua of course. And then the period of Judges. Ruth comes somewhere in between. We don't have any specific category for that, but it's still period of Judges. From the description of the nation of that time. Uh, King Saul covered by 1 Samuel, King David covered by 2 Samuel, uh, Israel under Solomon, 1 Kings, book of 1 okay, well, Kings covers um, uh, Solomon and a few other uh, kings after him, including when the nation was divided. 
and then two kings begins there and then takes it forward um, northern israel and assyria covered by two kings even going up to babylon and capturing southern judah and then of course middle persia we have esther um, i'm talking only about history books so esther um, ezra and nehemiah is when they return back um, i'll come to the new testament in a bit now if we go to the third column there i have listed all the prophets and the wisdom literature when they were written down so you find psalms proverbs ecclesiastes song solomon of course all them all of them correspond to the time of solomon solomon was the main contributor for them the psalms the main contributor was king david main there are other songs also in the book of um, psalms but uh, uh, the, uh, the other prophets obadiah joel obadiah was one of the first writing prophet Uh, people like elijah elisha did not write their own books or uh, books under their names these are the what were called writing prophets obadiah is the earliest of them uh, uh, based on reasonable evaluation joel jonah amos hosea isaiah and so for example why did jeremiah lament lamentations is here why did jeremiah lament because northern israel had been captured southern judah Uh, southern judah hasn't been captured yet but jeremiah was told by god that it was soon going to be captured so he was lamenting he was like, oh how come this and how come that and so habakkuk even if the fig tree doesn't blossom why did he say that because to him also it was revealed that southern judah was going to be captured and he was trying to reason out with god he said how come you can do this god you need a nation our nation needs to be preserved but god said no 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 even if i wipe them out through babylon now i can still bring them back it's not as if i am um, i can't do it you see what i'm saying and that's why he then came to the conclusion i will trust you you are saying you will do it even though i don't understand i'm going to trust you that you are going to do this and that's where habakkuk's uh, thing comes in you know daniel in the uh, lions den which uh, uh, so of course daniel was captured first so he was also he lived also as a young boy in the free judah but then he was captured and taken to babylon and there he was in the lions den he saw all the he interpreted all the dreams you know the statue of head of this and all this uh, for babylonian kings later on he interpreted even for um, the last of babylon kings was writing on the wall and then when the medo persian rulers came they figured out daniel was a wise man so they brought him in and appointed him again daniel remember the time when he opened the windows and he was still praying who was ruling at that time a medo persian ruler was ruling um, and uh, and so he, yeah so that's daniel and then daniel malachi and then Haggai and Zechariah during Ezra and Nehemiah's time. So that's the Old Testament. New Testament, of course, uh, life and works of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, life and works of the uh, apostles. As history is book of Acts. But all the epistles are covered here. Because all the epistles are supposed to be... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the table isn't over there. So it's just a uh, page is over there. But uh, yeah, all the epistles... apart from the book of revelation which is supposed to be yeah, which which was written during the same time but is an eager expectation of a glorious future so that's that's how the books match up in other words you need now you should have an idea of the timeline who writes when and therefore when you read something uh, of a writer how do you take it and so on any any questions at all um on the on the chat room also uh, on the whatsapp group on live chat so, and uh, on the floor here any questions so got one from brother aaron um who's also moderating so brother aaron has said um arul do you agree that moses wrote or edited genesis and because moses knew god face to face it in no way invalidates his account of creation um So the first question is, uh, do I agree Moses edited or wrote? Yes, I do agree. So, so, so here is where, let's put it this way. Um, w- when we make comments about particular books or any uh, point in regards to Christian doctrine or history, um, there is always a nuance involved. We need to be extremely clear. Uh, the first point I'd really like to make, which I really want to emphasize is this. 
I have, in, in the case of Genesis, for instance, I have no reason to doubt the account of the nation of Israel there. No reason whatsoever. And, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I'd say why, hopefully in the next session. Not because I find a document saying, oh, I'm uh, Moses writing this. Not because of that, but because of some other logical construct. No reason to doubt this. Uh, similarly, when it comes to, let's say, the book of Job, I have no reason to doubt that it's a very, very historical account, even though I don't even know when it was written. And the reason I say that was purely because it came handed down through the history of Israel. In other words, the fact is, to me, I look at the nation of Israel, take their testimony, and based on they, their background, I'm going to say, you know what? This guy looks like a reliable witness. I'm going to go with the story. Even though, if you remove him, I can't validate the story. Do you see what I mean? So this is a very nuanced stance, but yeah, uh, and this is a, so in, in regards to the book of Genesis, Moses, yes, main contributor. What was the second one? Creation account, he did not see. How did he, what, how did he write? Is that the question? Or? Uh, and because, yeah, because Moses knew God face to face, it in no way invalidates his account of creation. Because he saw him face to face, no way invalidates. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, the point is, I think there are two, reasons, two sources of information for Moses in terms of the book of Genesis. One is the fact of what was handed down through the generations. And this is another interesting thing. When you go through uh, genealogies, one of the things you would find is, someone like Noah, would you believe, would have almost met Adam. Adam died just years before Noah. Only a few years before Noah. That's how the genealogies worked out. In other words, the point is, even by the time of the flood, there was first-hand information almost of what happened in the Garden of Eden. You see what I'm saying? So this is where all the details matter. Um, similarly, Moses, today, unfortunately, we, we are looking at it purely from a retrospective perspective, a retrospective view. But during his time, that wouldn't have been the case. During his time, you have the history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob preserved through their oral traditions. And this is where I'm not like the Muslims. Um, I don't believe in oral tradition producing reliable, reliably accurate documents in regards to every word. That will be a bit silly and uh, this will be part of our polemics when we get on to that. But I think roughly he should have known what happened to Abraham, what happened to Isaac, and what happened to Jacob and so on. Now, through Abraham again, um, um, uh, from Noah's children, Shem, Ham and Japheth, what happened prior to that? Um, that's source number one. But the point is, that's not supposed to be a, a, a reliable source. That's roughly a good source. Like a hearsay source, but more than a hearsay. But the crucial source, the one which uh, gives me the, um, what's the term? Gives me uh, the confidence in the book of Genesis being word by word accurate is the fact that you would never ever have anyone like Moses in terms of prophets apart from Jesus. Never ever. Look at Moses. Red Sea split. Um, uh, uh, ten plagues. A raw turning to snake. All sorts of things that, the, that um, Moses saw and not alone Moses, the entire nation of Israel saw. Um, but, uh, I saw Adnan arguing in the speaker's corner, uh, which was a mockery the other day, because I, I think I think he doesn't know basics of the Bible, which hopefully we'd uh, sort of um, hopefully catch up with him coming Sunday. But the point is, if you compare Muhammad with Moses, <laughs> you seriously have a comprehension issue. You seriously have a comprehension issue. Moses, no one comparable to him except for Jesus. But of course, Jesus is God. That's a different story. But in terms of being a prophet, um, uh, or doing the works of a prophet. And the point is, that's how he saw God. And therefore, for him, there was no reason to doubt when God led him to, uh, gave him details. No reason to doubt that. Just write it down, period. In other words, it's pretty much like, I have the best possible witness here. He is telling me, I haven't seen it. But why should I doubt him? Best possible witness. In terms of credibility, signs and wonders and this and that. And so Moses can easily see that this is the creator. And therefore, anything he says, I'll go with it. Yep. Any other question? Well, 
one more, one more. Yep. Sorry. Um, this one was by, uh, I believe her name was Christ Our Saviour, and she asked whether you believe in the gap, gap theory. Oh, creation. Yeah. Um, no. No is the short answer. Um, it's it's, it's a highly untenable, again unfortunate that there are some Christians or supposed Christians who are advancing these ideas and many times when they advance these ideas what I also find is that they don't know science also. They don't know science but they want to appear as if they are friendly with science and all that I can say is wait a second there are people who know science who are Christians who can deal with this. If you don't, I'm, I'm not saying only scientists should talk about science, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you don't know science, please don't deal with it. Let the ones who know deal with it. And there the point is, valid science, verifiable science goes hand in hand with what we know from creation account. And the old world book looks at these from a biblical perspective. It's not a polemic, it's an apologetic resource. From a, It's all consistent. No gaps involved, nothing involved. Um, uh, young earth, um, Abraham came in, uh, like I said earlier, about 2000 years before Christ, but interesting also roughly about 2000 years after uh, creation. So roughly in the middle there. Um, so roughly about 4000 years before uh, the flood. Roughly, I say roughly because uh, there's a bit of leeway here and there, but roughly 4000 years before Christ and about 2000 years now after Christ. That's, that's how I see it. Um, and any other view advanced has serious fundamental issues. And one of the modules we would cover is Bible and science. And we'll get into details of them. Any other question? Yeah. yeah. You said something about they, they were expecting Elijah before Jesus came? Yes. I, I thought that was the second coming. That, that, this is a remarkable question. Um, uh, we we'll cover more of this in one of our other modules, certainly, but I'd like to give a short answer. Um, which is, uh, we, uh, so let's put it this way. Um, the Bible, Old Testament prophesies about resurrection. And Paul even quotes that for scriptures to be fulfilled, uh, uh, Jesus rose up just as scriptures prophesied. But I'll give a challenge to Christians. Find where that's prophesied. And you'll find it really hard. Where do you find resurrection? You find uh, the idea of the reigning king, the suffering servant. Of course, if you need to put together, you might think, okay, resurrection is a good way. But where would you find the actual resurrection being prophesied? Um, and there is only one verse in entire scriptures as far as I know. There could be more, but as far as I know, only one. Point is this. Um, but we assume it has been prophesied. We, we, sometimes we don't inquire much. The point is, Jews look at Old Testament very different to us. And I would suggest that we Christians should also look at it like that. When we read the Old Testament, I think we sh I would personally discourage us to read the Old Testament from the viewpoint of a Christian, primarily. I'd rather say, put yourself in the shoes of a Jew before the time of Jesus and then read. And what, the, what, the, what would you then make out of things? And that is where uh, the idea of the second coming is very solid. And we'll deal with that in one of the uh, upcoming modules. But it'll be very hard to come to that conclusion unless you are able to put all sorts of scriptures together, which people found it hard. Hard to do. Even John the Baptist, someone like John the Baptist, he didn't know what the Messiah was supposed to do. And that's why he sent his disciples. Are you the one? So the, how many of us Christians today know about what precisely is going to happen during end times? We're still grappling, it's very complex. Um, so from their perspective, Christ had to come. Once, twice, they wouldn't even have thought about that. Christ had to come, but prior to him, Elijah had to come. That's how, uh, that's what, that's how I would have looked at it if I were there at that time. Today, of course, because we have more information, we have a slightly different view. Did I answer your question? So they would have expected Elijah to come before. Uh, but they wouldn't have viewed that as, that as first coming versus second coming. In both the comings, that is true, by the way. In both the comings, the same prophecies would be fulfilled. Elijah, who is John the Baptist for the first coming, the Messiah, and there is going to be Elijah in the future. And, uh, who is it? Will, uh, he, of course, uh, we don't expect him to come by the name of Elijah. He won't say, I am Elijah. 
John the Baptist did not say that, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Um, did anyone notice, just an interesting um, aside, um, John the Baptist, where was he living in the wilderness? What kind of clothing did he have? Fur clothing, like a wild man. What kind of things did he eat? Why are these things recorded in the Bible? Any guess at all? There's an old prophecy that says uh, he, he, will, he will be in the wilderness. Something in, is it Micah? Oh, yeah, yeah, that too, yeah. Uh, yeah, the way, way in the wilderness and so on. Yeah, that, that, is, possible. that is true also, yeah. But there is another a little, a little description of the person. It's like describing a picture of John the Baptist, like a photo. Oh, this is how he looks. He looks like a weird, wild man. He does this, he does that. He, any idea? He, he talks about the belt that he wears. I think he talks about locust also. And he talks about uh, fur clothing. It's natural, natural, um, natural, yeah. uh, natural has to do with uh, uh, the hair on your head. So you're talking about the detail of what he was like? And yes. I'm actually, it's like describing a brother Naju looks like this. Very, uh, sim very similar to Elijah. Exactly. Go and read the introduction of Elijah. Elijah is described as a man with hair all over. I mean, if you look at Elijah, you would have described him as a hairy man. <laughs> and come to John the Baptist, a hairy man. But not through his own hair, but through the fur. Which is quite unusual, apparently, for the time that he was in. And that's why they are describing it explicitly. And a wild man living in the wilderness, eating all these sorts of strange things, a belt of leather and so on, which apparently, because of the way they are describing, also seem uh, special and uniquely identifiable. Uh, uniquely be able to use to identify John, uh, John the Baptist and Elijah. You see what I mean? Uh, so these things are described. So when people saw him, if they had read the details of Elijah, they would have said, oh, this could be Elijah. Why not? And they come to him. So that's an interesting aside, apologies. Now we are getting into a topical approach. Uh, Topic-wise, we're going to look at a few things. How do we get to know God? How did people during biblical times get to know God? What kind of insight and information they had? How? What, what are the mechanisms by which they got to know God? Sometimes dreams, God is speaking dreams. Dreams, yeah. Speaking God, speaking through dreams. His word. His word. His word, yeah, recorded word. Yeah. But well, I'm mainly talking about the first hand sources. So the word at least is a second hand source for us, even though it's trustworthy because we've gone through some evaluation. We, we would, um, next session. But first hand especially, how did people get to know God? First hand. His actions and what do you mean by actions? Or what he does. Yeah, it's things only he can do. Absolutely. When he does it, you know, that's God. Yeah? Through the prophets. Through the prophets? Uh, what do you mean when he said through the prophets? Because the prophets would be in touch with God and tell them. Yeah, but how, how do the people who are listening know it's from God? <laughs> right. when, when it's spoken through a prophet. Science wonders, prophecy is coming to pass. So, uh, yes, young man, yes. God has spoken to um, the people. For example, Moses, um, God went down um, in the form of a burning bush. That's very good. Sometimes he showed up in person. Yeah, very good, yeah. Yeah, God speaks through other people, so. People who you, who you know are trustworthy could communicate to you. But I'm especially talking to you about the biblical times. Now what I've done is I've just categorized them into um, six, six categories there. One, God in creation. He demonstrated his creative power at multiple points in time. At multiple points in time, by the way, his creative power. Uh, God in creation. God in glory. At multiple occasions, God showed up. Not exactly with the glory he has in heaven, but a reasonable approximation. You know, Mount Sinai, when Moses went up, what he would have seen 
I mean, if normal people see, they might have gone mad. The absolute glory of God. Remember the word of God says, when he came down, his face shone. People were afraid to look at him. And so God in glory. And that happened at multiple points in time. Other theophanies, God showed up in normal human form. God showed up in other forms which you can see, not exactly all the brightness and so on, but still see. So other theophanies. And then of course God through signs and wonders and fulfilled prophecies. He says a precise thing and that comes to pass. Well defined, not, not, not random stuff. Here is where people claim, you know, of course we know at Speaker's Corner, people claim, oh, we, our, our guy has a prophecy also. What kind of prophecy has your guy got? That kind of, you can toss a coin and get to that prophecy. If, if at all, that is from... Um, uh, uh, that is a reliable word for Muhammad. You can toss a coin and get that. Oh, he's going to win. Oh, of course, if two people fight, one is going to win. <laughs> Not too hard. The point is, God of the Bible, when he prophesies, well defined, very well defined, and to an extent you can say, you know what, you couldn't have precisely pinned this down in the way he did. Through a mere prediction, through, through a mere random prediction, you really can't. For example, uh, I'll give a simple example, but we, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from giving an example now and go through go through the details um, uh, in a bit. God in relationship. God had a personal relationship with multiple people in the history of the Bible: Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Um, David and um, uh, prophets of the old, um, Israel as a nation through the judges and so on. Also in the New Testament times as a father and so on. And then finally and more importantly for us Christians, God with us. Emmanuel, God showed up. He showed up on the face of the earth to live for 33 and a half years with us. If you put all things together based on uh, in Jesus' life, you can't conclude anything else apart from saying, in the appropriate context, apart from saying, this is God. So he, he took the trouble to come and stay with us 33 and a half years. Um, so the point is, um, a few different ways in which we can, we have so far, even when I say we, um, people during biblical times got to know about God in multiple different ways. Um, first thing I said was God in creation. Um, of course, we have the Genesis creation account. Uh, like I said earlier, Adam would have experienced it. Suddenly you wake up knowing that you didn't exist before and then seeing this person just by you. And uh, Noah uh, almost saw Adam. So essentially he would have told all those people. In other words, creation account was a very real source of information for them. Um, so we see that Genesis 1-2. Um, we see that, um, of course, in um, Noahic flood, God, uh, God intervened. And by the way, Noahic flood is a very, very historical event. Across the world, various cultures preserve the history of Noahic flood in all sorts of different ways. Various cultures. Uh, for example, um, I, of course, I come from India. In India, there's a person called Manu. And uh, he is supposed to be the one guy who is the head of a family of eight people who were saved when the entire earth was destroyed. He was the only one along with his family to um, be preserved from a flood. And that's because he built a boat according to how God told him. This is a story which is preserved there. Uh, but they call him Manu. Um, uh, the point is, similar stories exist all over the place. Eight people, eight people, boat, eight people, boat, worldwide flood save, purely because they built it and so on. Um, so that kind of information was preserved, so uh, people got to know. Um, of course, um, based on that kind of information, what does Job write? Um, as to Job, God, God says this, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Can you hunt the prey for the lion? 
or satisfy the appetite of young lions and he goes on job 38 39 is a rich treasure trove where do you find dinosaurs where do you find this and that 38 39 job um this is one of the other reasons to say job was a very early man um so you find that there um and then apart from that in the book of job you find plenty of information um about science about creation and so on i'm going to skip some of these and um and then go to the psalmist what does the psalmist say about the universe the creation of the universe he says um, the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament shows his handy work day and to day utters speech and night and to night reveals knowledge there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them he has set a tabernacle for the sun and so on so the point is when you examine the details of what we see in the universe out there and carefully study them properly you get to know that something serious is going on behind the hood here and of course um, there are philosophical approaches to say that what we see out here could not have been possible through even a human being let alone a stone or something else or a non existent nothing um, and so for 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 us to have what we have here something someone phenomenal has been there behind the hood and that is uh, uh, science and bible uh, perhaps that uh, uh, during that session we get um, get into the details there about creation of human beings your hands have made me said job um, with him or wisdom and strength he has counsel and understanding if he breaks a thing down it cannot be rebuilt if he imprisons a man there can be no release and so on so the point is um man all of man's life is in god's control if he wants to enforce things he can there is no way when god wants to enforce something on a person he can get away outside of what god wants to do if he wants to if god, of course god doesn't want to do that all the time but if he wants to um so the point is that was appreciated uh, by job again um what does uh, the psalmist say again um you formed my inward parts you covered me in my mother's womb i will praise you for i am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are your works that my and that my soul knows very well so again examining all the creation of a, a universe about human beings about other life forms a job again gives some details here the psalmist gives some details um gives us an insight of who god is um in terms of uh, his creation now god in glory now we said earlier uh, israel is a nation which began to exist because of the will of god god said abraham can you please abraham obeyed and therefore we had a new beginning um but later on of course during the time of moses until that time they were a family they were a large tribe and they were slaves large tribe who were slaves but now the real serious stuff land a family a, a large uh, nation which is from a family with the land and that would be a huge political issue of course and that is where we see god's intervention mighty intervention and there in specific when during the exodus the number of times god showed up in glory to moses aaron and so on phenomenal and let me let's let's i mean there are a number of passages that given let me just uh, maybe read through one example um, um and this is uh, this is from exodus 19 9 to 25 Exodus 19 9 to 25 and maybe I'll read the next one also. Let's just uh, read this carefully and this should give us a an indication of how um the glorious theophanies worked out. Now it came to pass as Aaron speak to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold behold 
the glory of the lord appeared in the cloud sorry that's exodus 16:10 the glory of the lord appeared in the cloud and then um, exodus 19 like i said earlier 19 9 to 25 what do we find um and moses i uh, said and the lord said to moses behold i come to you in the thick cloud uh, that the people may hear when i speak with you and believe you forever how did the nation of israel buy into this idea that moses spoke to god if he had spoken to god in secrecy or oh, i was in a cave or was somewhere here and then suddenly comes out well, of course we find that some nations that we find today have believed but believe me israel would never have you need to explore the history of israel the multitudes of ideas that were advanced within the nation of israel even after the revelation of yahweh we would understand how much liberty they had how critically evaluating they were about all sorts of things that being the case why did the nation of israel come to the conclusion that god spoke to moses that's because they saw these magnificent things red sea, red sea. yeah red sea we're going to look at that uh, briefly maybe in signs and wonders at least red sea, red sea also was tremendous who else could do that uh, the river jordan split who else can do that uh, but here god in glory what what is the lord say behold i come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when god spoke the nation of israel heard it heard him speak uh, and they would believe you forever um and then if i skip a few verses there um yeah, maybe maybe i'll read the next um uh, next section please exodus 20 18 to 21 please it says now all the people witnessed the thunderings the lightning flashes the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they trembled and stood afar off then they said to moses you speak with us and we will hear but let not god speak with us lest we die they were terrified can you imagine let's say we are gathered here let's say this is the plain just by mount sinai mount sinai is just there they they saw moses go with his entourage with his few uh, helpers they saw them go and then they hear thunderings and lightnings and there is a cloud that covers and they hear a voice they can't perceive it completely but they are seeing glorious things and he is one guy is saying you know what maybe i'm going mad are you seeing anything here and a million people are saying yes of course we are seeing all that this is how their history began well no, not not entirely true their history began with the 10 plagues even before that but this is let's say the the second phase the 10 plagues let's say the first phase but this is the second phase and in this phase they are seeing god's presence not just the works of god which they did see earlier during the 10 plagues now god's presence who is that who is speaking god um and in one particular occasion moses comes down and they see his face um shining they couldn't deal with that um, so that's the kind of exposure they had so god in glory that should give us an example in exodus there are multiple such visitations why god really wanted to make sure that he gives a proper foundation for the people god of the bible is not a god who wants blind belief and that's obviously clear when we read through scriptures never ever wants anyone to believe in him when he has questions in his mind he shows up in obvious ways demonstrates and then and then expects then them to then stick to what they have understood after this when israel disobeys purely because they are used to being just slaves and therefore not used to being uh, proper stewards of what they know to be true because they are used to that um they messed up big time after that but the point is god they still at least appreciated that god is god and um and uh, 
they stuck to that basic understanding now to any any anyone who is familiar with the jewish temple which currently doesn't exist of course but when the jewish temples existed um, there is there are three portions to the temple the outer court the holy place and the most holy place this is the building temple um, the first temple that the nation of israel got was not a building temple it was rather a tent with an ark uh, which the ark was the one which was in the most holy the holy of holies the most internal uh, place in the temple the point is yeah that, that, that's all beautiful that's all wonderful many people many other people have temples you know if you come to india there are temples everywhere um, if you stumble down you might see a temple so what's what's the deal here the deal is this let me read this please um exodus 28 8 as uh, a so 25 8 and 9 and let them i'm reading just a small portion in a in a very long passage but this is what he says this is what god said he said let them make me a sanctuary referring to the tent of tabernacle uh, sorry the, the tent of meeting the tabernacle of meeting let them make me a sanctuary that i may dwell among them according to all that i show you that that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings just so you shall make it and see to it exodus 25:40 see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain what is he talking about showing i was he talking about showing or was he talking about telling you know the moses was suddenly given instructions or oh, this is how this, the, the, these must be the dimensions these must be the material that you must use this is how you must structure and so on so there was verbal communication also involved but if you note note carefully what god here is saying is according to the pattern that i showed you according to its pattern that you were shown in other words what god moses saw up on the mountain he did he just didn't he, he just didn't see a, a rough approximation of god he saw god in the glory as he would exist in heaven on his throne with cherubims on either side because moses saw them in the way he saw them he is supposed to go down and in the ark of the tabernacle in the ark of the covenant he then needs to have two cherubims in the way he saw but the ones he saw were real cherubims these are the representations you see what i mean a few different things in the temple um, were things that moses saw and that's a crucial thing i really want to advance god in glory god revealed himself in a glorious way for people to be seen and moses and aaron and so on are prime examples of what was um what, uh, of such um, such revelation i'm going to skip the remaining few verses they are all in the um, notes uh, that you have uh, maybe i'll just quickly go to psalm 80 verse 1 the psalm is says give ear o shepherd of israel you who lead joseph like a flock you who dwell between the cherubim where did this idea come from dwell between the cherubim when they had seen moses they, they had heard that moses saw it that this god dwells between cherubims and they also heard and that is why we have it like that in our temple you see what i'm saying so that information of uh, uh, the detailed um, visitation that god had to with moses um, was widely known again psalm 99:1 he dwells between the cherubim um now of course similarly what happened in the new testament time so far we have been focusing much on old testament of course even in history i did only 5 minutes of new testament that's primarily because new testament history some of us would be much more familiar with that's why i took the liberty but let's look at a similar thing matthew 17:1 to 8 now after 6 days jesus took peter james and john his brother led them up on a high high mountain by themselves and he trans and he was transfigured before them his face shone like the sun remember we, we spoke about the prophet like unto moses the prophet um 
So Moses would, would have been in their mind. What's happening here? Up a mount. And his face is shining now. A prophet like unto Moses. Um, Moses face shining when he came down. But this is of course much more than that. His face shone like the sun. And his clothes became as white as the light. And behold Moses and Elijah appeared to them. So Peter, James and John are. Have, they can't, they, I don't know what they spoke to Moses and Elijah. I don't know if they even spoke anything. Um, but the fact is they are seeing them. Uh, how did they recognize them? Is a different question. Um, uh, I would say they were essentially by the content of the communication. Of course, they had no reason to question the credibility of these people because they are all glorious. You know, looking at them, they are all glorious. So they wouldn't dare to say, oh, how dare you say, oh, Moses. You don't look like Moses. They wouldn't dare to say that. And therefore, they are going to take their word uh, to determine who they really are, to take them at their word. And what did they say? Maybe Jesus might have said, oh, Moses. You know what? We'll finish this work up properly. I don't know what they discussed. Through what they might have discussed, uh, the disciples might have understood. Um, and so then Peter said, answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, wish let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, and behold, behold, bright cloud overshadowed them. Again, what would this remind them of? Thick clouds descended upon Mount Sinai. Now bright cloud descended, um, overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So why did the Christians believe in Jesus? Well, because whether they understood theology or not, whether they understood our Messiah is supposed to be God, because that's, uh, that's what prophecies say or not, is a later story. They got very precise, simple instructions. Whatever he says, do it. Whatever he says, believe it. Period. Who am I who is speaking? You can see I am not someone on the face of the earth. You can see I am speaking from heaven. And that is the message that Peter and James and John received. And that's why in one of Peter's epistles he'd say, We did not believe in wisely crafted fables, but we beheld the glory of God. Um, and that is why a fisherman like Peter became a master theologian. Um, because of the revelation that he had. Similarly, Saul, Paul, before becoming Paul. Bright light. The Lord Jesus in his glory blinded him. Um, so again, revelation of glory. Um, okay, so that's one. Uh, God showing up in glory. Uh, in person, as theophanies. For us to perceive, not when you are asleep, but when you are awake. But God can show up in glory, even in visions. And a couple of, uh, a few, few, few such occasions are mentioned. Um, Psalm 18, 6 to 12. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. And my cry came before him, even to his ears. When the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken. Because he was angry, smoke went up from his nostrils. So what did the psalmist see? They, the psalmist saw things which even pertain to smoke coming out of nostrils of God and fire, um, devouring fire from his mouth. So he was, he was seeing all these things in the vision, the glory of God. So I'll skip the remaining things. Uh, Isaiah, what did prophet Isaiah see? In the year that King Uzziah, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. He saw it. In the glory, he saw it. Uh, sitting on a throne and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. He is able to even describe the seraphims. Six wings with uh, two, he covered his face, two his feet, and two with two he flew, and so on. Again, the whole earth is full of his glory. Again, um, um, visions of the glory of God. Similarly, Ezekiel had visions of the glory of God. Uh, but in, this, uh, in Ezekiel's case, it was glory of God in the temple of the Lord. Uh, not in heaven. He wasn't looking at the heavens, but he was looking at the temple. And in the temple he saw visions of the glory of God. Similarly, Daniel. This might have been a bit more familiar passage. 
What did Daniel see? I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, his wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A, a thousand thousands ministered to him. Uh, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. This is the Ancient of Days, who he describes as the Ancient of Days. But then he goes on to describe one like the Son of Man. I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Point here is prophets also saw God in visions in glory. Not just simple visions but visions of the glory of heaven, of things that were happening in heaven and so on. Okay, and what did uh, Brother Stephen, Operation Stephen, after whom Operation Stephen has been named. Uh, but he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So Stephen sees it and therefore he confidently testifies. Um, again, um, other visions, Revelation is, of course is a classic example. Revelation 1, 9 to 20. Um, and a few other passages in Revelation. I'm going to skip the remaining uh, just in the interest of time and move to Theophanies, other Theophanies. Uh, Theophanies essentially where God shows up in a way humans can perceive through their physical faculties, eyes or hear and so on. And we saw Moses also saw using his own eyes. So that's also a kind of Theophany, uh, but that's a Theophany in glory. Uh, now let's look at a few other, uh, just go through briefly. Theophanies in a slightly less glorious form, like human beings, showing up as human beings. Um, Abraham experienced that. Hagar, Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, experienced that. Jacob experienced that. Moses experienced that. Joshua, Moses, uh, the experience of uh, the burning bush is the theophany I've categorized here and under this uh, title. Joshua experienced that. Joshua uh, came, uh, uh, maybe only, uh, I don't know if uh, some of these things are feminine, but um, Abraham saw three men coming to him. But obviously in the knowledge that he had, he knew it was the Lord. How did he know that and so on is a different story. Um, I, I'm, today I'm not um, exploring why we believe what has been said. But what I'm saying is such claims or such revelations are in scriptures. Um, so Abraham met God um, as three human, three men who came to him. Similarly, Hagar met God. Uh, to an extent, she said, oh, I've seen God. I don't know if you've heard the name El Roi, which is a name for God, El Roi. And that name was given by Hagar. Uh, and the reason she gave that name was because she said, Today I have seen God just like how He has seen me. And that's why El Roi, the God who sees, He has seen me. Um, okay. Um, uh, Jacob wrestled with God. That's perhaps a bit more popular. Uh, there was a bit of a wrestling match between uh, God and Moses. The background to that is Jacob was a bit of a troublemaker. He was a bit of a trouble. He knows what is good, but he doesn't know how to get it. Oh, sorry, he doesn't know the good way to get it. He, he goes around the bad way to get it. Um, but uh, because he knows what was good, God was pleased with him. And so what he decided to do was that he'll, he'll, he'll correct him. He'll discipline him. And one of, the last of, one of the important disciplines came to him at a stage where... At a stage where... Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph's hip was dislocated. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And that was as a result of this uh, wrestling match. God came and he wrestled. 
the intention where muslims pick the pick this up oh, how can a man a mere man jacob beat god well god never intended to beat joshua uh, sorry um, uh, jacob that was the that wasn't the point point was to test how sincerely persevering jacob was going to be and that god was going to give him the final sort of correction by leaving a mark in his own physical body just imagine the trouble maker jacob now has to limp so all his trouble would be would have gone through the, gone out through the window that's what god did i know you're a trouble maker i need to change you and the way i'm going to change you is put you through rigorous stress you know we you know the idea of refining through fire jacob went through that so theophany is involved there and apart from that the le- sort of less known theophany is um, i'd like to point out samson's parents um samson's parents met god the birth of samson was announced to them even before he was born and the fact that he needed to be a La- nazarite was commanded to them he is supposed to be a nazarite that's why you need to bring him up um but the thing is um uh, on the first occasion when his mom met god she was too afraid she didn't even ask who that was she knew that was someone special a glorious person but she didn't want to ask his name so he goes back his husband her husband uh, asks her well what is his name did you not ask his name and then the person shows up again and then uh, get to know a bit more information the husband asked what is your name and remarkably the person who stood there he said why do you ask my name knowing that my name is wonderful why is this important isaiah later on gave us the information his name shall be called wonderful counselor it's not wonderful counselor it's rather wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father and so on and uh, samson's parents got to know him as that wonderful so um so that is another less known uh, theophany another less known theophany is uh, god meeting gideon god came and met gideon uh, gideon uh, god told him well you're going to help his way out gideon wasn't uh, confident that he could do that uh, gideon god him gave him an opportunity to test him gideon tested and at the end of the test he concluded that it was god who was speaking um and um, and he would somehow make this happen other theophanies at the bap- baptism of uh, jesus john saw the holy spirit descending like a dove so that's a the dove the the so he could perceive, see it um with his own eyes of course another one is on the day of pentecost tongues of fire uh, what does it say then there appeared to them appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them so they actually saw like tongues which are caught up in fire slowly coming down and resting upon them and then of course they also had uh, the gift of tongue uh, speaking out in tongues so so that's a theophany seeing that happen and um, i think i haven't mentioned a few other things here but essentially these theophanies are also very important for for those people to get to know about god and for them to then record for us to um evaluate at a later point in time signs and wonders we spoke about this a bit earlier at the start of the nation of israel um all sorts of signs rod turning to a snake and that rod eating the other snakes uh, of the magicians of egypt 10 plagues the lord fighting with the army of the egyptians the egyptian army drowning see uh, going like that at uh, the right time and then going back at the right time so it wasn't a coincidental incident they can clearly see it um, uh, see splitting is, is not a I, i think no one would dare describe that as a coincidence uh, but uh, even if they were tempted to do that well why would it go back again um, so so that's what happened to drown the pharaoh's armies um, mara's bitter water becoming sweet bitter water becoming sweet bread and meat from heaven manna they they have manna from heaven um right through their journey 
they had um, water coming out from a rock which did not give out water before purely because Moses beat that. Uh, they had quails. They had dinner prepared from all sorts of people who they didn't see uh, and coming to them in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, ser serpent lifted up in the wilderness, a bronze serpent. Not sure if they're familiar with this. Essentially, the Lord was upset with them because of something. He was going to destroy them, but then he gave them um, he gave them a last chance and that was to say, if you see this serpent, you would live. And uh, Moses essentially had to make a serpent, a bronze serpent. And then all the people have to do if they are impacted because of the plague the Lord had sent with their own physical eyes. They saw him. Okay. Um, now in terms of, uh, what are we seeing? So in terms of signs and wonders, we see that also in the New Testament. Um, you know, we, we, we said uh, Israel heard God speak when Moses up, went up Mount Sinai. Similarly, we saw in the Mount of Transfiguration, um, Peter, James and John heard a voice coming from heaven. And another occasion, John 12, 27, 29, 2, 29. Now it's not just Peter, James and John. It's a wider crowd. And it says, now my soul is troubled. Jesus is saying this. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Uh, but for this very hour, this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. A voice was being heard. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it, has, it had thundered. How did, how, how did that voice sound like to them? Like thundering. Um, and then they said, others said, an angel has spoken to him. So essentially similar things happen in the New Testament times also, apart from Jesus himself being on the face of the earth. Of course, Jesus himself uh, demonstrated the, sign, the signs and wonders of God, but apart from that. Okay, prophecies is the next section. Signs and wonders and prophecies. In this section, um, there are plenty of prophecies, many times which um, many Christians wouldn't be aware of. Why do we trust the prophets? You know, of course, we'd be aware of messianic prophecies. Yeah, messianic prophecies, which of course came to be fulfilled only 2,000 years ago. Well, let's say 1,000 years after they first heard them, um, or some of them. Um, but why did they trust in them before that? Of course, Moses and so on, signs and wonders. So they already had that introduction. On top of that, they had signs and wonders happening here in the Elijah, fire from heaven and so on. But also there was a steady flow of prophecies coming in, many of which corresponded to their immediate future. And they saw them come to pass. And because of that, they believed. Um, and one, uh, there are plenty of examples I've given here, but uh, all of them are very similar. I'll stick to one example here, please. Um, this is not a verse, by the way. This is my own paraphrasing, which I copied from another set of notes that I prepared. <laughs> Jeroboam was judged. Um, Prophet Ahijah prophesies that dogs and birds shall eat whoever belongs to Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first of the uh, kings of the northern Israel. Um, first of the kings. And uh, a prophet called Ahijah. Of course, a well, less known prophet. Uh, a prophet called Ahijah prophesied that dogs and birds shall eat whoever belongs to this man. All his family would be eaten by dogs and birds. Now that is a kind of, that is a prophecy. See what I mean? This is not some tossing the coin, oh maybe this might happen, or oh, may, oh, he'd die before 50 years. Well, <laughs> may, may happen, may not happen. Even if it happens, it's not clear that that happened purely because you said that. But imagine this, a king's family, dogs and birds, Eating them? Does it normally happen? Yes, brother. Just thinking about prophecy, though, isn't it? It's, there's a difference, isn't there, between us and Islam in that it's not just about telling of an event or something that's going to happen. It's telling about the situation now. So it can be about telling, um, being honest and quite hard about actually how we are as people. So I think of I think of Isaiah, what he says to the nations, what he says to Israel, 
about their situation. I think about Habakkuk and the others, and they say, and he says, um, these houses you've built, you know, I think uh, in particular of, um, uh, yeah, Habakkuk, I suppose, um, you know, th this real, um, this, there were two words that the old, old Christians used to use about prophecy. One is forth-telling, and one is foretelling. Forth-telling is about you and your situation now. What do you need to change? Yeah. <coughs> the other thing is about actually saying this is going to happen. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. I agree with you in the sense that prophets have two roles to play, at the least. And uh, only one of them is what we're talking about here, which is forth-telling. Uh, but the other is very valid also, foretelling. But my point at this juncture is, I really don't care if someone is foretelling or not, if he is lying about whether God sent him or not. You see what I mean? I mean, I could tell you the truth. I could say, you know what, something, let's say, some person, oh, he, he, he is six feet tall. The Lord told me he is six feet tall. Well, I could say the truth. I mean, in this case, of course, it's a very objective truth. But I could say something which is a bit more detailed, a bit more, um, let's say, um, hidden. I could say, as long as I can perceive it, but can still not be from God. You see what I'm saying? But um, here my point is, how do we know God's interaction with the world? And there the only, uh, the way we can establish God's interaction in the case of a prophet is, through a way where we clearly can see what he has done is supernatural. Either he clearly predicts and that happens or he really tells something which otherwise no one can ever say. That is true. But um, yeah, uh, are you with me on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's just, I want to just say that there is a difference between prophecy and the way Islam understands the prophetic the way we do. Is, is, Islam has got all sorts of things wrong. Yeah. All sorts of things wrong. Um, and of course we need to, un that's very unfortunate because many Muslims are caught up in it. Very, very unfortunate. And the reason they're quite happy where they are is purely because they don't know the real stuff. They don't know the real stuff. They really don't know the real Jesus. And this is where we need to take the message to them in clarity, in truth, and in comprehensiveness. And then I'm sure at least the uh, well-intending Muslims would then say, wait a second, that's so much better than what I've heard. And that's sounding a lot more logically good, valid, and so on. So I, I, think, I think, but apart from that, um, my, my evaluation is I, I really can't, I'm, I'm, I'm at loss of words as to how people could have really bought into the system. And I think that's where the history comes in, that's where the threat of violence and so on come in. And I can imagine how I'm not, how people could have said, I'm not convinced, but I know I'll be killed otherwise. I'm okay, fine, okay, sort of thing. And that, and that then propagated from one generation to another. But apart from that, I don't see a logically sound framework to their claim of how to identify a prophet and so on. Uh, and this similar things happen, by the way, dogs eating, an entire family of the king dying did not just happen once. Israel, by the way, had many dynasties. Unlike southern Judah, which only had two dynasties, but both when they were united and after they were divided, they only had David's descendants ruling. Uh, Northern Israel uh, had, um, if I remember correctly, at least 11 dynasties ruling and at least three of them, maybe actually four, yeah, at least three of them had similar prophecies. All your family would die, none in your family would remain and this is the kind of death you would die and that is because this is the kind of wrong you have done to my nation. And all of the times uh, those prophecies came to uh, pass in precise detail. And so the nation of Israel continued to uh, stick with the Lord. New Testament prophecies. 
Of course, we know about prophecies from the Old Testament which Jesus still have to fulfill in the future. But Jesus himself gave short-term New Testament prophecies, things which would happen in the immediate future from him. For instance, Peter. Peter, you deny me thrice. Um, similarly, um, Jesus said, they are going to crucify me. This is how they are going to lift me up. And I will rise up in the third day. That's a prophecy that Jesus gave in precise detail and came to pass in precise detail in history. So in other words, even though he was God, he also demonstrated power even through prophecies, even in New Testament times. Okay. Um, so what we have seen so far, um, we have seen God um, in uh, glory, um, God in terms of signs, wonders, uh, prophecies, um, God in terms, God, God, God in um, creation, God in other theophanies, and then now fifth one, God in relationship. Um, essentially, how did God reveal himself in the Old Testament times and through the remaining times also? God spoke to Adam. God came and met Adam. Uh, Genesis 3, 8 says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And, uh, and Adam and, the, and his wife hid themselves from, from the presence of the Lord. So this is not just some voice calling out from heaven. If that is the case, there is no reason to hide anywhere. Where do you hide? You are, you are equidistant. In mathematics, we use the term equidistant. If, if the voice is from there, regardless of where you are in the earth, you're almost at a similar distance from there. What are you doing? Hiding. They hid because, as it says there, uh, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They obviously had seen something which, a, which was a manifold presence of God. And so they were hiding. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him, says Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Um, how did God interact with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Uh, I've just taken one example each. Abraham, Genesis 18, 17, before God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, what did God say? Shall I hide from Abraham what I am going to do? Why would I hide? He's my friend. And uh, he, he uh, reveals, in other words, that's the kind of relationship God developed with people in history. Um, similarly, I, Isaac, the Lord appeared to Isaac, him, and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Appeared to him, showed up to him. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in this land which I, which I shall um, tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all, the la all these lands. And I will perform the oath which I share to, sorry, swore to Abraham your father. So God maintained a relationship with Isaac. Similarly with Jacob. We see and the Lord uh, stood above it and said, I am the Lord your God. The God showed up when, Ab when uh, Jacob, this was, uh, uh, this was when uh, Jacob was running away from his family because he thought his brother could kill him. Now uh, he's running away to Laban. And at that time the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham and your, fa your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you. Because he's running away, God comes and says, By the way, this is the land I'm going to give you. So you go in there, but I'm going to bring you back. So he developed relationship even there. With Job, we know things that happened to Job. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Just look at the kind of point there. He was saying, He is my man. Have you come before me to talk about my man? You see the uh, relationship there. That is the kind of relationship which um, Lord had throughout um, time with various very important people. About the nation of Israel, what does the Lord say? You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, Exodus 19, 4 to 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So the way the Lord took Egypt, sorry, Israel from Egypt, it was a, it was a very intense love affair. You have seen me, I, 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 am like the, I am like the eagle in its wings bearing its younger ones. I am that. That is how I brought you. Um, and then he goes on to say, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, 
then you shall be a treasure, a special treasure to me, above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of a kingdom of uh, priests and a holy nation. So the point again is God was developing relationship even with the nation of Israel. Similarly, uh, the various judges that we find in the book of Judges, uh, various kings, David, Solomon, um, the way uh, you must read, uh, you must read the uh, 2 Samuel 7, 18 to 29, uh, a discussion that God had with David. And again, what you would find there is a very, very intense uh, relationship there. The, the amount of emotions involved. But David would say, God, why did you choose me? Why me? I'm just a mere, the least of the least sort of discussion. And, um, and I'm, I'm, this is indeed a pleasure and so on. So if you read through that, you'd find plenty of emotion. And the reason for that is because of the relationship. Not just, oh, I'm God. Oh, I'd like you to do this, please. And he said, okay, okay, let me do that. Um, sort of um, idea. And find that with Solomon. And there, are, and there is, of course, a reference to that. You'd find that with the prophets. And I've given Habakkuk as an example there. And um, you find that so God showed up. Of course, God is introduced as, as a father in the New Testament to us. And as the bridegroom for the bride, which is the... Uh, which is the church and he's also being described as the head of the body and as good shepherd so that's the kind of relationship it's not just a god who creates it's not just a god who demonstrates that he is god but it's also a god who builds relationship moves along with you uh, us loves us so dearly not alone in the new testament but right from the start throughout the Old Testament and coming into the New Testament. And um, yeah, God with us. And this is of course the New Testament. New Testament times. Emmanuel. Um, at times, Emmanuel is translated as God is with us. That's not really what it means. It's not saying, okay, yes, God is with us. That's not what it is saying. It's rather saying, this is God with us. This is God with in his presence with us, if, if, if you see what I mean, which is a different thing from saying, when you say God is with us, you're purely stating a fact saying, okay, God is with us. But when you say God with us, is essentially pointing to a person and saying this, God, he is God with us. Not just saying God is with us as a matter of fact, but also pointing to the person and saying he is God with us. You see the difference? And that is how Jesus showed up in the New Testament. And that's, that's the prophecy of God with us. Um, and Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 18 talk about, uh, talk, talk, talk about the way Jesus became one like us, with us, one like us. In as much as then, as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him. But before that, as much as the children have partaken, he himself also did. In other words, his intention was to become like us in every possible way. And through that also we find uh, the revelation of God um, in our lives. And Jesus of course said, come to me all you who labor and are heavily laden, um, caring. Come with me, I am here, available for you to access. I am God with you. Um, and similarly, the 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 lamentation that Jesus had, Matthew 23, 37, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you, your children together as a hen, as a hen gathers her chicks. How, how intensely did God, Jesus, want to bring Israel to him, even during his first coming? He intended that to be as much as a hen would want to gather the chicks. And how intense would that be? Well, ask mothers <laughs> and they could tell, tell us. Um, you, you, you need to ask my mom the way number of times he chases, she chases me, asking me if I've eaten and more of this and that and so on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, that, uh, that's the level of intent God has, um, even in the New Testament, and especially in the New Testament. 
And now I'm going to skip a few things. God in the future is about prophecies and we're going to have a special session for that. One of the 13 modules is that, so I'm going to skip that. Names of God. One of the uh, unfortunate things is many Christians also, even many Christians don't know the various names of God which are actually reveal the nature of God. Um, I'll just quickly go through some of these names. El Elyon, El Roi, El Shaddai. Some of these people would know, um, or more would know. Um, El Shaddai is a more popular name. El Olam, Yahweh Ire, again uh, more, uh, more popular. El Elohi Israel. Of course, Yahweh is more popular. Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh Rafa, Yahweh Makadeshkar, Yahweh Shalom, Yahweh Sabot, um, the Lord of hosts who dwells between Cherubim, Yahweh Roi, Yahweh Sitkinu, Shama, Elohim Israel. Um, so these are names which people are. Yes. Um, so. Yes, Adonai is a term that we use in regards to God. Uh, and Adonai literally means the Lord. Yeah. Literally. Um, so in that regard, I haven't put, put that down as a name per se. It's a generic word. For example, this is where you have some of the other gods called as Adonai. Yeah, um, Adoni, Adonai, uh, variants of, those, of that word are used in regards to other gods also. Just like Baal. Um, um, the, 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 for example, in India they say Lord Krishna. The same idea is used. But here I am talking about names. These are unique personal names uh, for um, God. And apart from that, yes, absolutely. What you said, Elohim, Adonai, um, what else is there? And of course, m m the most crucial one, of course, um, um, is our precious name, Jesus. Because in the New Testament times, you can get to know all of the other ones, which is very interesting to know. But if you miss out, if you miss out the name Jesus, because that is the name um, through which we can be saved. Uh, God of the Old Testament, His pleasure is for all of us to know Him through, through the new name Jesus. Um, now, uh, maybe a couple of other minor, uh, not minor things, a couple of other less known things is would you happen to know that Jesus is going to receive a new name even another name in the times to come Revelation 3.12 he says he who overcomes I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more uh, I, will, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven from my God and I will write on him my new name 19.12 says he had a name written that no one knew except himself so there are names on top of what we know um, even in the days to come which are um, of um, we, we, which are new um, okay so some of the uh, remaining things I'm going to skip through um, fairly quickly now nature of God Again, I think, I think so there are a few notes there, but my focus is going to be on the fact that, of course, we understand God to be omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the judge. Everything you can think of which, which is beyond human capacity and capability, it is him who is the authority over all those things. And, and of course, part of the fact of the nature of God is, of course, he is triune. And you can find, uh, bro brother, just to comment on that, you can find a simple example of the triune nature of God, even in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 48, um, well, especially verse 16. But then if you read even a few verses before that, and even go, go into verse chapter 49, um, you'd find uh, the triune nature of God um, there clearly. How do we get to, how did people get to know the character of God? Of course, people need to know the character of God if they need to, if they, you know, you need to know the character of anyone who you want to relate to. What does he like? What does he not like? Why does he like what he likes? Are they reasonable things? Are they unreasonable things? And so on. How did people get to know that? Uh, well, primarily, firstly, through the law, the Torah. Uh, the law, by the way, isn't just what Moses received. If you ask a uh, uh, Jew, they might also say, even the instructions that even Adam received, for instance, 
do not eat. That is also included in the Torah purely because that's an instruction. So people might have that sort of idea where Abraham had received instructions from the Lord, uh, except not as part of the Mosaic law, but even before that, but specific instructions. So various, um, various uh, such things. As uh, so the law of the Lord is the was the first reasonably comprehensive source of information of who of the nature of the character of God. Um, and I think I, I would just stop with that for now because I think the remaining two we're going to talk about in a bit more um, um, in, a, in a bit while. So I'll, I'll um, perhaps stop things here in the interest of time and essentially open up the floor for maybe uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Also in the questions, yes please. Uh, questions on the floor here. So what we've covered in this session is really what are the different ways in which people have understood about God. In the Old Testament times, in the New Testament times, especially in the Biblical times. Uh, what are the different ways they got to know? And of course we said they would have got to know God through creation, God by seeing God in glory, uh, by seeing other theophanies of God, the God through signs and wonders and prophecies which came to pass in um, in uh, in in short uh, in, the in the in the short future from their point of view, and um, and God in relationship, and then finally in the New Testament times, God with us through all these various interactions that people had, they would have understood God. That's the kind of thing that we have covered now. Questions, comments. On the chat room, did we have any questions, Brother Darren? Okay. Can I ask a question in the meantime? Yes. yes. The Jews and the Muslims, do they regard the Messiah as being God? Um, or is the Messiah separate from God? That's a very good question. Muslims obviously uh, don't. Because they appreciate Jesus to be the Messiah. That's why they call him Al-Messi. But they have rejected him from being God. So obviously they have um, undermined that. Uh, Jews, it's a, it's a mixed bag, the reactions that Jews have. Some, uh, clearly, for example, the passage that we read, Daniel, and uh, the simple idea that the Messiah is going to rule eternally, which a normal human being won't be able to do unless there is something going on in a special way behind the hood. Uh, the point would be, with Jews, you'd have plenty of different sh uh, shades of ideas. Uh, there are certainly Jews who take uh, the idea of Messiah being God seriously. I'm talking about Jews who haven't received Jesus as the Messiah yet, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, even though they have rejected Jesus from being that Messiah, they might still hold the idea that Messiah ought to be God. You could find such Jews also. But then there will be also, uh, in the other end of the spectrum, uh, people who say, Messiah is not even an important person. It's just a pure um, tool which who God used in their mind. The Father used, the God used. So he's just a vessel. You could have been him. And this is where there is the Jewish idea. Every generation a Messiah is born. It's just that God is waiting for the right time. And when the right time comes, he'll pick up the Messiah of that generation and use him. But otherwise, there are every generation as a messiah. Every generation as a potential messiah, is how they say it. Um, sorry, just a yes. question. That, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that might not be exactly related, but uh, why did God choose the Jews if they were going to reject him later on? Why did he choose them? Because the, this question that I've been asked and I've struggled to answer. Why did he choose them as the chosen ones? To, uh, and then knowing, he's all knowing, that they will reject Jesus as the Christ. Okay, so that, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so the question is for those who are on live stream, um, uh, our brother here is asking, why did the Jews, sorry, given that the Jews have rejected, I am uh, repeating what brother said, uh, verbatim, or oh, somewhat verbatim, uh, given that the Jews rejected Jesus, why did God still chose them as opposed to someone else. Um, there, the, in, the reason I said I'm repeating what you said is because not all Jews rejected. That's very important for us to know. The entire church is Jewish. 
the first church was so jewish to an extent even by the time of the acts of the apostles the romans couldn't differentiate between a jew and a christian they couldn't to them they they are both the same that's how popular that's how central the idea of jesus being the messiah was in jerusalem and in israel later times changed changed uh, the picture entirely especially after 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and people were spread spread out then the guys were spread out then had to work things out and say oh, okay how do we deal with this rabbis began having their own strongholds this is where rabbinic judaism began advancing even further uh, but yeah firstly um, it's not true uh, all Jews rejected jesus uh, as a matter of fact in the first century you would be tempted to think all Jews are Christians when i say all i don't mean exactly all but most of them typically if you find run into someone you would think oh he must be a christian sort of thing a common man that's how popular remember the um, emmaus wrote to emmaus uh, 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 jesus walks with the walk, walks with his disciples and they ask uh, with yeah with his disciples but they didn't realize it was him this was after resurrection but they said oh do you not know this do you not know that the um, this such and such things happened in other words the point is this was on bbc everywhere um even much more than the fact that we are out of uh, um, eu today which i suddenly realized when i was driving um and getting it suddenly realized oh, wait a second we all the out um but uh, much more than that they would have understood um so that's point number one uh, point number two is if god had to choose uh, god had to choose some nation essentially the reason for choosing the nation uh, he at least had uh, two intentions at, at least one maybe three actually one is where one is to have a people for himself to whom he can clearly communicate what he likes and doesn't like he needs to have some people otherwise well, to whom does he say that Uh, and the other is and this is what he did through giving the law and the other is he needed someone to send the human messiah through so he needed some human being somewhere to do that so he uh, that's those are two and then the third one i'd say is also for them to he needed some people for them to understand that he genuinely is a god who loves and he had to demonstrate that and so he needed someone to be vessels to to be recipients of his love Um, so in other words he had to choose some people now question is if not this way who else would it be yeah is it unfair on the others as well uh, yeah we will get to that a bit later uh, after this but the point is if not for his way if you reject his way purely because some of them are going to reject then god can't choose any any nation on the face of the earth some people reject god some people receive god Uh, sometimes more more people reject and le- less people receive, uh, reject and so on so all, all all sorts of combinations but the point is i i can't see any nation in the world today any old nation especially where i can look at them and say you know what if god had told them properly they would have stuck to it that's it you can't see any such um, and so why not is where would be the question and uh, the point there would be because of abraham he had to choose someone of his line and he said okay isaac and jacob not because of the descendants but because of them now isn't it unfair i would say not necessarily if you understand the theology behind what's happening not necessarily let's put it this way i am a tamil i come from india i came came to this country which i call my country now only 12 years ago and uh, now you are zack you are greek in your origin now we met we spoke for the first time let's say a couple of weeks ago and we've known since then the point is you being a being of a greek ethnicity origin and me being a tamil are you any less than me or are you any more than me no. so you you're just different to me that's it you're not me i'm not you you're just different that's all but apart from that purely because you're greek you don't have any special status before god or purely because i am um I'm a Tamil. I don't get any special status. The point is something similar, even in regards to Israel. No one in Israel is going to reach God purely because they are of Israel. No one is. They are going to be destroyed as much as we are going to be if they mess up individually. And so the selection, uh, so that we need to bear in mind. So there is no special treatment there. 
the only thing special with them is i'll speak to you i'll speak to the world through you um and that came both with benefits and with drawbacks both um, i i can't remember the verse i i would have liked to point out this particular verse or verses or passage but god essentially cares told them because i'm giving you this privilege where you hear from me i'm also going to balance that with this enormous negative side to it which is if you mess up i'm going to destroy you big time which i won't do with the other people okay if assyria messes up if nineveh jonah turns up and they purely put up ash cloth and say oh we repent that's it enough they'll be saved but if israel messes up like them purely putting on a sack cloth and repenting for one or two days isn't going to help you see what i'm saying um and in, only in that regard it's a bit different but to me on a on a personal level certainly doesn't count on a personal level whether i am a jew or not does not have any bearing on whether god would receive me more than anyone else or whether i'd have more chance of being saved than anyone else with me on that yeah cool question from um one person in the chat from big eo7 is the holy spirit called god in psalms of david is the holy spirit called god in the psalms of david is it by b said or seven yeah yeah um, in the psalms of david i'm trying to remember if there is a place in the psalms where the holy spirit of god is referred to as god i'm um, off the top of my head i can't think of anywhere now and as a matter of fact a holy spirit of god being god is something which is revealed in a f- in fewer places than even for jesus um that i can say and that is because you know we sometimes we say jesus humbled himself took a human form i would actually also say well holy spirit of god seems to have humbled himself a lot also you know we we, we normally say oh we have a meeting and jc is the man who is behind the scenes most of the time you know we use such ideas he is the one who was behind the scenes he didn't get credit for most of what he did yeah a similar idea would apply to the holy spirit of god the father is glorified through the son the son is also glorified but how many times do people go go around to say i'm going to glorify the holy spirit of god in eternity in the earth here not many times but is one but it is clear through scriptures that he is god one in three persons but the fact of the matter that's where the fact of the matter comes which is each one seem to have made tremendous sacrifices in their own regards um in the way they have interacted with us um and so uh, in regards to that particular question off the top of my head i can't um um uh, i can't remember a place where david calls a holy spirit god in the psalms um but i'd also say even if there isn't one i wouldn't be surprised because there are very few places very few very deep ways uh, through which you understand the holy spirit of god is god and if you blink your eye for a moment you might miss the miss that insight and uh, that's all things are is what i'd say Uh, by the way in this regard i'm purely focusing from a christian view point from a 21st century jews had a very sophisticated idea about holy spirit of god even before the time of the new testament where they clearly saw the holy spirit of god as god uh, consistently uh, but uh, i'm not sure if that idea is as developed uh, from the old testament amongst christians i'm not sure okay yes please Okay. Um verse uh verse verse 10 from verse 10 create in me a pure heart o god uh-huh. and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast from me your presence or take your holy spirit from me. Uh give the reference. Yeah. Psalm 51 verse 10 probably verse 10 11 verse 11 51 yeah. um so so i'm not sure if that quite answer 
if that's quite what uh, the brother there would be looking for, um, certainly Holy Spirit of God would have been seen as a distinct person for a shrewd observer in the Old Testament times. That's certainly true. And uh, certainly the Holy Spirit of God would have been seen as someone who obviously was acting as God in the way, through the dynamics, implicitly, even in the Old Testament. But uh, I'm not sure if this place actually says that Holy Spirit of God is God in a simple way, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Which is what he was hoping to find, I think. In Psalm 104, it says, When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you, renew, you renew the face of the ground. So that is giving an indicator that the spirit creates. Very good. Yeah, it's essentially points like these, which I, I think the Jews would have used to clearly understand, wait a second, everything God does seems, uh, it seems like he's doing through the Holy Spirit. So it seems like he, yes. Even in the beginning, it says the spirit of Hovering over the face of the earth. Which is the rock. The yeah. So essentially, in other words, um, I think it will be hard to find a statement saying, of course in the book of Acts we do find one such statement, uh, where clearly the first century Jewish view is represented when Peter said, you have lied against God. When clearly he was talking about lying against the Holy Spirit. So we find uh, the clear uh, expressions of that in a few places like that. But in vast majority of the places, it's essentially like what Sister Susan was saying and what the brother here was saying, that the Jews, especially looking at the Old Testament, would have clearly seen that it seems like the God they know of doesn't do anything without the Holy Spirit. It seems like they're working hand in hand in what they're doing, um, if you see what I mean. So, so they would have seen him and given him the... Uh, address, uh, sorry, uh, given him the respect that is due to him. Uh, brother Amer is asking a question. Yeah, Brother Raju. Yeah, just to continue with that, uh, yeah. Psalm 139 also says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Good, yes, that's all, yeah, that, that, that would indicate the omnipresence of yeah. God. Yes, absolutely. So, indirectly, yes. Individual salvation was still individual. Salvation. It? So God chose Israel as a nation. To do what? God chose Israel as a nation to accomplish a few different temporal, earthly things. To send a Messiah, he needed some human being. But purely because the Messiah was going to come through a nation, it doesn't mean the nation is going to reach heaven. Uh, yeah? So... God chose Israel to fulfill certain purposes on earth and that in itself is a privilege and that privilege wasn't given to anyone else um, but the fact of the matter is to reach heaven though you still have the individual responsibility you, you just can't say exactly what Jesus said <laughs> um, um, I know, this is a yeah, uh, when, 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 when people thought were of the mindset, oh, we are going to make it because we are children of Abraham. Jesus challenged that idea. John the Baptist challenged that idea. You being a child of Abraham isn't going to help you unless you sort your life out. Unless you get your act together to respond to God in sincerity and truth just as much as how he would expect anyone else to, you are not going to make it to heaven. Yeah, and that's what I meant when I said, it. if they had a special privilege, I am born a Jew and therefore I am going to reach heaven, then that would be a concern for me. 
Oh, oh, no. How come I'm missing out on that? Why, why don't you take all Tamils and take them to heaven? Why don't you do that? Why only in the nation of Israel? But that is not what the promise is. There's only one caveat there. That there, is a, there is a promise of all, all Israel getting saved. Um, all Israel uh, would get saved is a prophecy which Paul deals with in the book of Romans. Um, which many, many Christians take that to mean such a special privilege. All, but uh, the nitty gritty behind the hood reveals otherwise. Um, I think it is Zechariah who prophesies in the Old Testament. The way that's going to happen is God is going to destroy all those who are unfaithful in Israel. So let's say, let's say tomorrow is the end day, theoretically. Tomorrow is the end date. The Lord is going to return back. And the way the Lord is going to work is today is going to take a list. Okay, these, these guys I'm going to destroy. These, okay, they are, they, are, they, are, they are on track with me. These, I'm going to destroy them out of Israel. I'm going to destroy them. And these, now, suddenly when you have these people destroyed, the, the one good ones, who the Lord, any, when I say good ones, the ones who are going to get the benefit of the cross, God could then say, look at them and say, you are the only Israel. You are all Israel because they are wiped out. You see, you see the way the Lord fulfills his prophecies. Sometimes you need to be careful about the way he fulfills prophecies. And this is the way uh, uh, um, uh, the prophet says. I can't remember exactly which prophet. Two thirds of Israel will be wipe, wiped out is what he says. Question, Brother Raju, did you have a question? Brother Amir also has a question, I think, uh, in the chat. But did you want to go first? No, no, I didn't. You didn't, okay. Can we read? Um, Oh, Brother Darren is away. Okay. Um, What's the question? From the chat. Yes, from the chat. Uh, Brother Amir says, Amir, Amir says, can you please address this? Of course. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, the verse in Quran says, Oh Mary, indeed Allah gives you good tidings of a word from him whose name will be the Messiah. Can you clarify the word? Word. If the word itself is Jesus, then there should be no conflict with our Christian belief. I would like to think so. Yes, um, the Quran certainly in places have theology consistent with the Bible. That is the case. That is very true. Unfortunately, that has been balanced out with plenty of things which contradict the Bible. And this is where, uh, you know, you might have seen Christians who take the approach of saying, you know what, the Quran actually talks about Jesus. So we'll enter in through the Quran, that's fair enough, works for them. From, but from what I see, to me it seems like Islam is a well-crafted counterfeit. And it seems to have been crafted over a long period of time. Not just one instant, I, I don't think Muhammad contributed to all the Quran and uh, the rest of the stuff. It seems like even if Muhammad was a person who lived in the way Islamic tradition claims. It seems like the entire Islamic uh, theology comes from a much longer period. And the point there is they seem to have, once every way, once they figured out every way the Christians launched an opposition, they then sealed that cap by saying, oh, by the way, there is a hadith like this. We'll add a hadith like this. Oh, by the way, we'll do this. That's how they seem to have done things. And because of that, they have developed a very sophisticated means to counter Jesus, to offend Jesus, to deny the deity of Jesus. Um, uh, but when they did that, they didn't remove the previous tiny things which, which were put in here and there. Is what how I see things. Um, it is true, this particular quotation should mean, if, if Jesus is the word of God, it should have enormous implications. And the Quran does say Jesus is the word and he is the spirit of God. But the problem is um, because of the other confusions they have introduced, um, it's harder for Muslims to see it. That's uh, my response to that, uh, Brother Amir. I think the way the doctrine of faith and the associated salvation has been put together, I think there is a very deep legal thought that has gone behind it. Let's put it this way. What if I receive Jesus just now and then I die? I haven't done anything. 
If there is a requirement to say, oh, you need to be doing A, B, and C, I wouldn't qualify. How am I going to, what am I going to have? Am I going to go to heaven? You see what I'm saying? I think the way this doctrine has been laid out is very comprehensive legally and it's also sophisticated theologically. What does God require of us? God is not expecting us to be people who tick A, B and C tick marks. But he's expecting us to be faithful children who really care about the Father. Who really care, for, care to fulfill the desires of the Father. Uh, is our heart really there? When it is really there, for example, if I do nine things, not one, would God do something bad about it or not? You see what I'm saying? There are plenty of um, details that go behind it. And when we do the gospel um, module, uh, we'll, we'll see how this all fit in. But by no means am I suggesting that as Christians, we have no responsibility. We do have and we'll be held accountable when we don't fulfill. And the way the Lord is going to catch us out is going to be phenomenal. Um, and there are legal clauses which he, I mean, he knows how to bring things together. And we'll see some of the sophistication, uh, sophistication and nuances in relation to that in that module. What is the gospel? How does that work? How did Abraham become this father of faith, the right, uh, become a righteous man. How did God see him as a righteous man? Was that because he did A, B and C and he tick marked those things or was it purely because he said, I genuinely believe in you and, there, and the, through the rest of his days, his intention was to stick to that. Yeah. Any, uh, any question or There is one other question in life. Bible. I don't know. I don't know. Mind check. <laughs> so yeah, there's one other question in regards to Job. Uh, Job chapter 26, verse 7. Um, I believe it's where the Lord says He hangs the earth out over the north, and, and there's nothing beneath it. Paraphrasing. Do you see that as being any connection to flat earth? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, Christ, Christ our Savior is the. Um, uh, this, this idea of flat earth is a phenomenal thing and I, I unfortunately I even, I, I even found, um, I even uh, found uh, someone who is a Christian uh, and I, I think there are maybe many Christians who are into this uh, pure, uh, and as far as I can see it's purely because they want to have some fascinating stuff to hold on to. Uh, they, they, they want to find some meaning to life or whatever and this challenging the establishment by saying the earth is flat seems to give them an opportunity. Um, but unfortunately, evidences seem to contradict us, um, uh, contradict the flat earthers all over the place. Uh, uh, portions like what you're talking about, uh, many of these are, uh, need to be understood in the context of how they were written. And ho hopefully we'll get into some of these details, challenges, scientific challenges that are launched against the Bible. Uh, in, in the module Bible and Science. Yeah. Okay. If nothing else, quick. Is there a question or? No. Cool. Okay. So, uh, first thing we saw, history. Second, God. Third, the problems and the solutions. The final thing, um, which of course uh, was intended to be at least half an hour, but we only have a few minutes left. Um, and that's really the dynamics, the Old Testament dynamics versus the, uh, and the New Testament, yeah, the dynamics in Hebrew scriptures and then the dynamics in the uh, New Testament. And there what I wanted to say was, essentially, if we see what was happening in the Old Testament like a picture from, uh, from uh, like, a, like a video from, from, a, from a distance, how would things look like? Um, and there we would see there were of course nations involved, various nations of course which developed in the book of Genesis and then developed a bit more. Uh, when I say develop I don't really mean get to a better state, I only mean uh, became bigger. Um, and so yes, uh, much more in terms of coordination and so on. Um, so you see Israel, you see the other nations. So by the time, uh, let's say, by, um, um, 
Yeah, maybe towards the end of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, but maybe just before the time of Jesus, how, how, how was the dynamic of things? Um, there was the nation of Israel, there was the temple of God, Jerusalem, the temple, and temple of God, and then the Torah. The Torah and the temple of God were two sort of leading lights for the nation of Israel. And here is where you know, we find the Sadducees versus Pharisees in the New Testament. A bit more uh, research on that would tell us Sadducees were more temple worship based people, whereas the Pharisees were more uh, read the Torah, get to know the Torah and implement the Torah in your life based kind of people. Um, so there was both the priest, uh, sorry, the temple and priestly um, worship as one sort of uh, uh, congregating point and another congregating point was the Torah. And that's in the nation of Israel. But what also you find is that Israel had already developed many enemies around itself. Uh, many of them began existing um, uh, once Israel came out of Egypt and going into the nation of uh, Canaan to receive it and becoming Israel. You find people who were upset, people who, who were thinking, oh, how come the, this God does this only to them? Uh, we'll fight against this God and all those sorts of um, responses you got. And even after they went and settled down, there were still people who, want, who wanted to fight them, wipe them out, like the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Moabites, uh, the Edomites, uh, the Amalekites, um, and slightly later on you have the Syrians, um, and then, and then um, uh, a bit later than that, you begin getting the empires attacking them, Assyrians, and then the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians and later, of course, the Greece, Greeks. Um, and then finally, Rome, not finally actually, even after Rome. And there are a few other Gentile forces. Uh, um, um, Brother Steve and myself, we were talking about that uh, during lunch break, I think. So, that's the sort of politics that was happening. Um, in the nation of Israel, it's the law and the temple. Um, and by the way, one important point there was, if you wanted to worship the Lord, you better go to Jerusalem. You really can't worship Him elsewhere. That was a stringent requirement. Anyone who worships the Lord ought to go to Jerusalem. Jesus, Samaritan woman. The discussion, remember? Uh, why do the Jews tell us that we need to be there? Jesus said, oh, there is going to uh, come a time when you can worship from anywhere. You're going to worship in spirit and in truth. But until that point, the requirement is Jerusalem. Um, so that's the sort of dynamic um, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures. So more details we can go through a bit later. Oh yeah, so uh, in terms of offices of leaders, of course initially you had the judges. Uh, so initially you had Moses. He was one of a kind. And then Joshua was his assistant. So let's say he was just a mere follower. Uh, next in line after Moses, but beyond that it was merely judges who used the Torah, who implement. During this time the king was God himself and you would find that when people asked for, saw, uh, for a king, because purely because they saw kings in other lands, chariots and wars and so on, they fancied it. They said, how come we don't have it? We are like a, a bunch of, uh, um, uh, how do you call it? What's a good term? Bunch of people who don't even have any organized stuff, we're just peasants. living. What's that? Peasants. We're a bunch of peasants just, uh, eating our stuff, nothing more sophisticated than that. And so they were attracted towards all the stuff that they shouldn't have been attracted to all the chariots and the war and the leadership and the gold and the silver. They had gold and silver also. But I, I, I mean, gold and silver on their thrones and on their um, um, whatever else. And so they said, We want a king. That's when God expressed his displeasure. His prophet Samuel at that time said, uh, Israel are rejecting me. Because prophet Samuel saw him as the leader. But God came and told him, no, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Because I am their king. And I am managing this nation through my judges. Haphazardly raised up. Apparently, or seemingly haphazardly raised up. But I, everything is worked out in, our, in my mind. It, it's all in control. But in their minds, it's all haphazard. Um, and they are rejecting me. Okay, if that's their desire, that's fine. I'll give them a king. So then began the kings. During the time of kings, you have, of course, the prophets and the seers. Um, like I said, I think there are multiple prophets and seers in the Bible. 
who 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 are in many cases unknown, literally unknown to many Christians. Uh, but those are important people who have some important contributions in scripture, some of which we would see hopefully at some stage in one of our modules. So these are kinds of the leaders in the Old Testament. Yeah, Hebrew scriptures. But would you find many of these in the New Testament? No. What happened in the New Testament? Essentially, what was temple, a physical temple in the city of Jerusalem, right now has become across the world the temple who are us. On whom or in whom God wants to dwell. We are the temple of God that God wants to build. It's not just the nation of Israel now. God wants to bring in any and every people from all over the world, which was the case even earlier also, but now even more vigorously. God wants to spread the news um, uh, to bring people in. And so we are the temple of God. Um, God wants to be in, in residence in us. Uh, in the Old Testament, God was resident in the temple. The glory of God came down in the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was placed, of course, in the Holy of Holies. But um, in the New Covenant, God wants to rest on top of us. We are His vessels. We are His tools. If we don't do stuff, He can't get stuff done on earth. Um, so that's the plan in the New Testament. Um, um, Israel is again going to get, to get its time in the future. Because all the old politics, you know, all the rivalry, all the enmity, jealousy, all of that is going to be resolved together with the issue, with the rest of the issues in the world um, at Armageddon. Jacob's trouble. Everything which is uh, like an open-ended uh, thing currently from the Old Testament and everything which is in regards to the New Testament, holiness and so on, all those things are sorted out, going to be sorted out. Armageddon, um, and then uh, the white throne judgment after that, but Armageddon is uh, described as Jacob's trouble, uh, which we are fast moving uh, to, I think, uh, but there are still some variables which need to be in place, which are not in place. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, so, so that's, that's how the New Testament is. Uh, we are the, so in the, in the New Testament, we are part of the kingdom of God. It's not the kingdom of Israel, we are part of the kingdom of God, but Israel still has its place, its place. Um, Israel is the eternal, what is called the commonwealth of Israel, is what the Lord Jesus is going to eternally rule. And it's going to, it's essentially the kingdom of God where Jesus himself is going to sit literally on the throne in the temple in Jerusalem and rule. Amen. Praise the Lord. And prior to that time, any and every enemy force is going to be wiped out. There's not going to be any argument, nothing of that sort. When the Lord returns back like a roaring lion, uh, the word of God says, uh, the sword of his mouth, the word, the truth, with that he's going to wipe out every enemy um, um, and then he's going to come and rule. There's going to be widespread destruction. But unfortunately, prior to that, there's going to be a massive fall. Um, uh, so here is where, see, this is another area where, again, when we deal with prophecies, hopefully we can get into some of these details. Does the Antichrist come before or after or this and that? Let's get into some of those details, hopefully. Uh, purely as a matter of uh, getting to know prophecies as evangelists, not to become experts. How are Christ our Savior, how are Jews going to, going to be saved? How are Jews going to be saved? Um, it's a very good point. Uh, Jews, like I said earlier, have a special promise of national salvation. But that's going to be fulfilled only at the end, not prior to that. Only at the end, unlike for any other nation, for the nation of Israel, all Jews are going to receive Jesus as the Messiah. But I also gave information as to how that's going to be fulfilled. And the way it's going to be fulfilled is anyone who is not prepared to do that is going to be wiped out before that. Because once that's done, it's only those who are going to receive him anyway, and they're going to be called all Israel, and they're going to be saved. Uh, that's the national salvation. 
now in regards to everything else they are very similar to us individually in the old testament times if if, if the question is about the old testament times the point would be did you keep the torah did you show your dedication to god by keeping the torah now of course we do know as a, just to clarify what i mean when i say keep the torah i don't mean make no mistake because the torah isn't just about not making mistakes the torah is also about when you do make mistakes this is how you can ask for forgiveness you see what i'm saying this is why jesus said that uh, mercy triumphs over justice did you not read it jesus challenged the jews on a couple of different occasions the law is also about mercy and forgiveness when we completely read it properly the eye for an eye is an often misquoted thing people always say oh there's an eye for an eye and therefore it's very horrible well that's not what it intended to communicate it intended to communicate something else but maybe we'll de deal with that later so now the point the uh, the so during old testament times if you wanted to show your faith towards god you need to fulfill the torah if you do mistakes take appropriate remedial action we find people uh, zechariah and elizabeth uh, the parents of john the baptist described as perfect according to the commandments now during new testament times you really can't keep the torah because the new uh, the um, the uh, temple is no longer there so the during new testament times why did the lord let the temple be destroyed i really think the lord let the temple be destroyed because he he really wanted to push the jews into thinking through this because once you don't have the temple you can't do your normal stuff when you can't do your normal stuff now you need to be thinking what do i do now and then try and find answers and that is where you'll be pushed to evaluating what did jesus say why did he say that and so on so the lord has deliberately done that the jews unfortunately many of them some of them have accepted but uh, the last time i checked out some details it seems like they only maybe 4% 5% which is uh, not a huge deal but uh, but uh, things are going to change the word paul paul goes on to prophesy that uh, we have all become christians when they have rejected the messiah and paul's point is if their rejection has led us to come to christ how much more their acceptance so there is going to come a time when all the jews of that time remember two thirds wiped out one third and when they do it there's going to be a massive wave towards accepting jesus perhaps many muslims would be thinking what's happening here we thought we were with the jews we we thought we can use a lame excuse by saying jews also don't receive you now they are receiving what do we do and then suddenly wake up and say okay we need to consider this seriously you see what i'm saying there's going to be a massive wave like that um, according to scriptures romans 11:25 says uh, mike can you hear me yeah but don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery brothers and sisters reading from the niv so that you may not be conceited israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the gentiles has come in yeah do you believe that's still ongoing yes right yeah yeah so so currently Israel isn't experiencing national salvation. Any salvation in Israel is much like how um, a Greek in Greece would receive salvation. Individually, he needs to take a step to receive. Just like how a Tamil would receive salvation. Individually, he needs to take a step. Uh, and that's what's happening amongst the Jews also today. Individually, they need to take a step. But uh, at a future date, things are going to change. and the other question uh, if i can uh, uh, so essentially i think the question was uh, if jesus did something about the father what did he do uh, if jesus if jesus does not mean you separate you separate from the father separate from the so the term separate is an interesting term uh, so here is where i go back to the idea of infinity this is where uh, you know the uh, confusion of the three three gods and so on when people really grapple with the begin grappling with the idea of infinity what we would find out is infinity um infinity exhibits some very interesting attributes which might seem very paradoxical and one of those things is 
You can add anything to infinity, it will still be the same infinity. It might sound paradoxical, we don't, we don't find that in any, with any other number or anything, but with infinity we find that to be true, through strong mathematics. So the point would be, uh, this idea of us saying we have Jesus as God, the Father as God, we're not really saying they're two gods. The moment we understand God is infinity, we won't come to the conclusion then that they are two gods, uh, that they are separate. Jesus, nowhere in scriptures would we see the Father separate from the Son. They are one within each other. Jesus said, I am in my Father and my Father is in me. And they are highly intertwined. But that is not to say you can't distinctly identify when Jesus shows up. You can. And this is where infinity again comes in. The infinite nature of God is something we need to uh, begin grappling with to answer some of these questions. I think this is a question about what's the difference between when the Lord says, uh, I and the Father are one. What's the difference between that and saying, me and the, I and the apostles and the disciples are one? What is the difference? Those two so, I mean, um, so here's where we need to deal with a couple of different things. Uh, one is uh, well, the eternal nature, uh, right from the start, going into the future. And the other is how things could be in the future. Uh, alone, future alone. Uh, in terms of the eternal nature, we find that the Father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father, and so on. That's the eternal nature. But in terms of the future, well, Christians are going to receive much privileges. Christians are not going no, Of course, we put on this mindset that we are servants. We need to fulfill the desires of our master and so on. But we are going to be, we are sons, not going to be. We are already sons. We are going to be co-heirs along with Jesus. You know the throne that I am going to, you are going to sit on? Is the throne of Jesus. In the book of Revelation, he's, uh, he says, Just like how I sat on my father's throne, you are going to sit on my throne. Just imagine for a moment, I still haven't begun grappling with that idea, apart from maybe brief, sort of uh, um, uh, thinking about this briefly, not much thought given to it. The fact of the matter is, Christian position of our eternity is a very, very, very superlative position. Absolutely superlative. Just Brother Greg is King Greg. Can you believe that? You are a nation of kings and priests. The Lord, of course, is King of Kings, but He is going to be a king. No, not just a simple king. Maybe of uh, Windsor and Eaton Riverside, or maybe London or UK. Not even the whole world. King along with Jesus. In all of creation and beyond. So that's how you, who you, that's how you're going to be, that's how I'm going to be, and so on. So essentially the point is once we begin grappling with that, some of these, the apostles one and so on, would pale in comparison. Uh, these, uh, these ideas. Um, show me where Jesus said, I am God, worship me. Um, um, quick answer, Jesus said, um, I am the one greater than the temple. Uh, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. When you understand the context properly, he was clearly meaning that he was God. The only God that Jews would be aware of. Uh, more details are involved. We'll get into that later. We have an entire module on the deity of Jesus. Um, we would uh, get into details at that stage. Um, second one, well, the first one was, show me, no, sorry, uh, separation. So, no, it's basically some the before that, the first part. My question is, can there be separation between Father and Son? Can there be separation? No. In the Trinity, there is no separation. They are one in each other. Distinct, but not separate. Distinct. No separation. Although they were separated for three hours. No, the Father turned his face away. So the entire, so that, that, that is where, uh, that's a whole new area. Uh, God is omnipresent, yet he has his face pointed somewhere. Okay. 
God is omnipresent. Yes, he is seated. Yet he is seated on a throne. If he is seated on a throne, he is just sitting, sitting there, isn't he? No, he isn't. This is where the infinity comes in again. Um, so the fact of the matter is, when uh, what happened during the three hours? The face of the father was turned away. He couldn't see. Jesus said, "Remember," he said, "I see what my father do, and then I do." Um, that relationship was cut off, but they were still one in each other. The manifold, holistic relationship wasn't there during that time. Okay. Thank you very much. A quick wrap up. Um, so the module today. So of course. So no. Um, um, one thing I'd really like to encourage. Uh, for all of us, is, uh, if, if this module has been productive, I'm quite glad. But um, really what I'd like to say is God strength. I know some of you are already ministering. I haven't asked uh, in detail every one of you. But I do know, of course, some of uh, Brother Darren and so on. So we have been ministering for a while together. And some of the others have been ministering in a few other ways. Uh, but, the, but what's in our mindset is to mobilize all of us. And that is where we really need to cheer. Uh, me delivering this, well, uh, uh, the Lord uh, gave me an opportunity to study all these things and present. I have done my work. Let's put it that way. I have done the work which the Lord has commended me well, uh, for today. <laughs> I have more work to do, but for today. Um, but my mindset is, we really, if we can, of course there might be more, uh, there are about 70, 80 people registered for the um, formally registered. Um, a few are still in progress, but uh, 70 or so fully registered. Um, if we can mobilize at the end of this year, mobilize all of these as sophisticated evangelists, operating in signs and wonders and everything else also, but also in deep theology, where no one dare challenge them. And if they do, guess what? They'll get answers. If we can mobilize people to that extent, and if we can have them across the world in all sorts of different settings, that's what uh, would be marvelous for us. And through God's grace, we'll get there. Yeah. Would uh, maybe one of you uh, like to pray for us? Brother, would you like to pray for us, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we could gather here today. Lord, I just pray that you impart something that instills a revelation in us. That, that gives us greater knowledge of you. It gives us greater knowledge of your love and your expectations. Lord, I just pray as we go out here, you increase whatever we have to share out in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Ah, sorry. So one question, one 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 question. question before you go. Thanks to uh, Roger today for organizing the facilities. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have a lot of time. I'm going to go on a mic. My mic check, okay. Yeah, my uh, also, just before we go, there is a donations basket which is uh, up on the table. Um, if everybody can make a contribution, that would be appreciated if you've got it. Um, but we want to make sure that we keep these facilities and we can repeat the opportunity if need be and more people come. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Thank you for the yeah. press from Brother Arrow. Round of applause for Brother Arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, excellent, and uh, thank you, everybody. Right. I'm going to challenge Brother Darren and say, don't make donations. Maybe later. <laughs> uh, thank you, JC. Thank you, JC. JC works non-stop. Okay. So I've got these books. If uh, people want to take copies, you're most welcome. Okay. I've got these ah, yeah. two books here. What are the books about? Uh, um, oh, the, I don't, okay, that's the first one you used at the beginning. But what's the other ones there? Like, uh, so, can we get a print out of what, the last, what you were reading in the last few hours of that? Ah, okay, yeah. So this is all, uh, this is all has been sent to you. Oh, has been? Okay, as, yeah. as PDF, Thanks, in the group, in the WhatsApp oh, group. Oh, lovely, lovely. Thank so you. it's all really there. Yeah. And uh, hopefully from next time, the idea would be that I should send out the handout even two or three days before ah, the yeah, module. Yeah. Great, so you can read up a bit today. The, uh, the, this is for Christians to get to know about the portion of scripture before the Noahic flood. You know there are all sorts of different views. Yes. So this would um, give you reason for why I hold the view I do hold, which is 6,000 years old, 
new new um, young earth and so on uh, but it's not entirely polemic it's uh, purely from an apologetic perspective it doesn't cover everything uh, but hopefully in the future some more so this is for christians this is this is intended to be read even by non christians actually the okay. primary audience for this is non christians but this would help christians in um, getting on top of the some of these things and this is about the historical jesus even if you approach the study of jesus purely on a secular level we come to the same conclusion that jesus is god and there's no yeah so we can do hiding yeah so those are the books yeah the family are obviously asking how to get the books okay um, unfortunately the books haven't been published yet but uh, we can work out a way to uh, get uh, somehow, somehow yeah. get get this uh, sent over to them yes sometime soon it should be on uh, operation yes. steven yes so okay brother thank you very much thank you very much everyone hopefully today was productive yeah.